Welcome, everybody, to the Christmas edition of Movies, Music, and Mayhem. I'm Rachel Silvestrini, your host. Um, this week, we have a fantastic guest. Um, you all know and love him from the movie Trivia Schmodown. I almost beat him in the last year's holiday special. Oh, almost. So close. Would have been such a nice thing to say. Um, <laughs> to say, I beat Bibbs. It's never going to fucking happen, though. Um, so as you all know, welcome, my guest, William Viviane. Hello. Hello, it's, darling. How are you? It's crispy and it's nice. Uh, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. How are, how, how are you? Happy crispy. Happy crispy to you. I'm good. I'm hey. just imbibing because Christmas. Oh, that's fine. I have a, a big, tall glass of uh, uh, iced tea, but I ran out of iced tea, so there's some water in it, too. I was like, is that a giant glass of whiskey? Because no. wow. No, 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 no. I don't drink in Schmodown and I don't drink and do anything else really. I don't really drink much anymore. That's that's fair. I mean, yeah. I, I've been Help yourself. Help oh, yourself. Yeah. Don't let don't let me don't let me ruin your evening or anything like that. So oh, nobody shames yeah. me out of drinking. Good. <laughs> You're not my mom. <laughs> um I she'd, be, she'd be pouring with me. Um, shame never stopped anybody from doing anything. No, it just makes you feel bad a little bit afterwards, right. but then you get over it. Exactly. Um, so Christmas is literally next week. I'm not happy with that at all, actually. I, <laughs> it, it, this has been the slowest year on record, but it feels like I haven't been able to get in any of my Christmas stuff. Uh, and that really takes me off. Says, uh, you know, December is always a really busy month in like the film industry. And this year, less so because obviously not as much is coming out. But, you know, if you do all those like best of the year lists or anything you're trying to cram in as many movies as possible. And I'm also trying to like make money for the family. And as you know, I host like a million podcasts. So it's just been a really hectic time. Yeah. It's, it's, it's never slowed down. My mom actually got home from work. She works for some mm -hmm. reason an 11 hour day today. And I'm like, Linda, mm -hmm. when the day is done, you stop. <laughs> yeah. Just stop. She's also retiring in like a week and a half. So I'm like, you don't owe Aww. that shit. Um, so I'm yeah. really excited for her, but she comes in and I was like, uh, I can't remember what I was gonna say. Uh, <laughs> how much? How much booze have you had so far? Literally just the sips I've had. Um, okay. no, but she came home and she was very like exhausted, and I was like, "You just like it's it's just you need to like relax and just get over it." And she like started stressing about Christmas. I'm like, "Mom, it's just it's just the two of us." <laughs> like. Why are you stressing out? Like, you don't have to give gifts for everybody. Like, it's just the two of us. Like, we literally put a moratorium on gifts for the family. We're like, nobody's getting anything. Yeah. That's, that's, a, with you. that's that. You know, that's a trick, though. You know, everyone's getting gifts now. You no. can't say you can't say we're not getting any gifts this year because then it's just like, ah, uh, but I couldn't resist because I love you so much. Here's your gift. And then your hands sort of go like, right. no, I'm literally. Uh -huh. On a big TV, and I'm literally just gonna walk down on Christmas Eve and like put a bow on it and be like, "This was your Christmas gift." You I told you this. <laughs> I'll just put a big bow on me, and it's just like it's like, me. I've, yeah, I just Merry Christmas. Merry um, yeah, Christmas. for some reason this yeah. year. Has, yeah, for some reason this year has felt oddly sped up and slowed down at the same time. Like. I didn't feel like I felt more Halloweeny until like mid October and then nothing. And then Thanksgiving was like Halloween to like the second week of November and then Christmas from that time on until like now. And I'm kind of like, Oh, we still have to go through Christmas. Yeah. It hasn't, it hasn't happened. <laughs> I haven't, I feel like you haven't been able to enjoy Christmas. Do you have a thing that you have to do every year? It's not Christmas. And I don't mean the usual stuff. Like, put up a wreath, decorate the tree. That's the usual stuff. Do you have like one thing that for you, it's not Christmas time until you do this or get this accomplished? Um, Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's actually funny enough. Uh, what I'm doing next week, uh, we are doing a watch along for the Muppet Family Christmas. Oh my God, I didn't even mean to set that up for you, but enjoy <laughs> your plug. <laughs> That's a great plug. That's a Thanks wonderful plug. Um, just like a nice little tea. Is that the one where uh, they go to Fozzie's house? Yes. Well, I love that one. This is Fozzie's house. That's um, a really cute one. Yeah. It's so sweet. Um, it is a Christmas. It's like a TV tradition. Like we literally have a VHS of all these old school, like TV Christmas specials, like the Smurfs and 
the Fraggles and this one. There's like a toy for Christmas, I think, which was like another Jim Henson puppet thing. Oh, you mean the Christmas toy with the, which basically like Toy Story before the Toy Story? Yes, with the the tiger and then like R rugby tiger. Yeah, yeah. We just yes. did a we just did a podcast about that. It hasn't I, come out yet. It's coming out like tomorrow. I love that special. Like nobody has seen that special, and it's it like amazing. fills my heart so good. I think Disney has been because the thing is that was originally a Disney special. It was on like ABC and the Disney Channel, oh, yeah. and it had an introduction from Kermit. And then what happened was Disney like lost the rights to Kermit for a while. Like they got the Muppets and they lost the Muppets. So like there was a DVD release which I have, which just removes the bookends with Kermit the Frog. And which is fine, it still works on its own, but it is weird. And then they finally put Kermit back in it for the Amazon Prime streaming release, which is out right now. But for a long time, my theory was that that thing was kind of kind of shelved because if you watch a, the Christmas toy, you realize that the makers of Toy Story, my, my you know, it's a little suspicious how similar it is because it's also about. Uh, toys who get like really jealous when like new toys come in on a big holiday and the new toy is a sci-fi action figure that doesn't realize they're not a sci-fi action hero. Like it's pretty on the nose. Yeah. It's really, I mean, it might be coincidence, but it's weird. She's really badass though. I remember watching that as a child and being like, oh, there are things like that for girls. And I got so excited. Yeah, it was cool because it was it was supposed to be this toy for a little girl, and she had gone from this like uh, sort of my buddy kind of doll to yeah. a do a tiger, do and it. then do it do a tiger, and <laughs> then she was she was like graduating to like action hero toys, and there was this Meteora toy, and the catnip mouse got to sing a song to Meteora about how great she was. You Which is are lovely. Meteora. It was adorable. Oh my god, I love. Oh god, that whole. Now, now I want to go downstairs and watch it after this because it's you just should. like it's so sweet and wholesome and it's wonderful. Yeah, I usually do an evening where like we just plug in the D. Like we still have a working VCR. Funny Good. enough, yeah. And we still have like my entire. I remember I came home one time. My mom was about to throw out my entire like Disney clamshell collection, and I was like, <laughs> "That is my retirement plan." That's a lot that. of money. That is a lot. You got to. You've got to be careful yeah. about your parents throwing away because sometimes your stuff is just your stuff, and who gives a crap? But like, yeah. they don't know what the good stuff is. And I remember when I went to college, and my parents were like, <laughs> "We're going to throw away all your comics." And I said, "Dad, <laughs> your baseball cards. Mom, your Beatles lunchbox. Don't you dare throw anything of mine away. You could be paying for college right now if your parents hadn't done what you're currently threatening to do." And yeah. they were like. We apologize. You can keep all your stuff, and they had, and I appreciate yeah. that. It's like it's like if you don't want it out, that's fine. Just like yeah. store it properly yeah. and safely, and I will come and go through them and take them off your hands. But like I, she, I was like, you better be. I came. I remember coming home and like she had them in a box. I'm like, you better be dusting the shelf. <laughs> She's like, no, I was going to donate these. And I was like, no, well, you weren't. <laughs> Like I think I, I, that, I, love, I it's think not I like he the, said no well you weren't, which is really funny to me because it's like a Christmas swear. No well you weren't. Mm -mm. <laughs> no well you weren't. No well you weren't. Yeah. We actually uh actually funny enough, uh, my mom and I watched Noel last night. Uh from, Oh, is that the Anna Kendrick movie? Yeah, it's super I haven't seen that yet. Okay. It's That's it's nice. really sweet. Um mm -hmm. it has a really great message to it obviously because it's Disney mm -hmm. and it's Christmas. Um That's not necessarily given. Disney can have some wonky messages when they're when they don't modern, think they're looking too hard. Modern Disney with <laughs> I'm referring to modern Disney. Did you ever see say you ever see uh, Saving Mr. Banks? Yes. That movie is evil. And I mean yes, but I also wept during it because I also mm -hmm. I had met um I had met the Sherman brothers. Ah, the Sherman so brothers came across real nice. I'll grant you all of that about the Sherman brothers. They're 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 sweet and they're well handled, but man, they just they really hate in that movie artists' rights. You know, that's just a whole movie about how we trampled all over this artist's creation, and it was the best thing that could have possibly happened for her and you and we're gonna make a movie about how the best thing that disney ever did was trample over artist rights and then make a movie about how awful that artist was and how ungrateful they were for how we changed their work so much 
that they cried during the screening, begged us to change it, and then wrote in their will that Disney is never allowed to touch it again. And then as soon as they died, Disney bought back the rights. Saving Mr. Banks is pretty messed up. I mean, if you look behind the story, yes. If you look to that, yes. I mean, I'm also just a sap, so everything makes me cry. Yeah. Well, there's good stuff in there. I actually think Colin Farrell's really good in that movie. Oh, he's fantastic. He's really, really good. And there's like, there's so much talent behind it. But like, that's one thing that I had, I discovered as I went on as a film critic, because a lot of people are just like, well, you know, if it's well made, can you really be mad at it? But like, yeah, it can be well made in service of something negative. Yeah. So it's still bad, even though it looks and feels kind of good. You mean like The Greatest Showman? Yes, The Greatest Showman is a vile film. It's so entertaining and it's the music so, is so good. It's so good. It is about the worst human being, probably one of the worst human beings ever in show business. And like, ah. Yeah. My, my, my one, the one saving grace, the one thing you can say about The Greatest Showman that might almost make up for that is uh, if P.T. Barnum were alive, that's probably the movie he'd make about himself. And I feel oh. like if you had started that movie with Hugh Jackman in character as P.T. Barnum promising to lie to us, mm -hmm. like the way he kind of does in the movie, like if he had made that, if they made that explicit, they might have gotten away with it. Yeah, but they but don't, and it's weird. He wasn't P.T. Barnum. Mm -hmm. And I was like, bullshit. Yeah. Uh, no, I also, I mean, I also love watching that movie just because like every now and then I'm like, oh, there's my friend Alex dancing in the background. Cool. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> that's really fun. I didn't know that. That's cool. Yeah, I have a bunch of uh, a bunch of my uh, Broadway kids are in like a ton of movies, so I'm always like, Aww. "Oh, here's Alex," or "Oh, there's Adam," or "Ryan," or blah blah blah. And I'm like, my mom's like, "Who do you know in this movie?" Whenever we go to watch a movie, like, <laughs> probably everybody. This thing keeps falling off. I can't do it anymore. Yeah, you know, I'm just. This is actually getting pretty warm. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. I'm gonna. I still have a Christmas necktie, and I wore a red shirt. I got. I got. Uh, oh. Go. He's, That's so funny. He, he's not that Christmassy. It's actually just a dentist and uh, and uh, and a deer, but you know, it's still nice. Oh, that's a cute. <laughs> my nice. best friend, my best friend Jessica was on the Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer uh, sh like stage tour, oh. uh, and so I went to like go help her out when was it last year or two years ago in uh, Riverside, and I got the T-shirt, and I was like, "Yeah, misfits have more fun." <laughs> Uh, yeah. The Island of Misfits. I think we're, I think the Shmodan is like the perfect example of the Island of Misfit toys. <laughs> kind of. I mean, it's amazing the different walks of life that people come from. And they're mostly people. I mean, you get some really like cool people who've done like all these amazing things, but like they're just from all over the place. And once you get to know them, you realize they're all just kooky kids. Yeah. <laughs> You know, they feel, we feel like we'd all be at like this one table on the other side of like the pergola in high school lifetime, regardless of our we come from and our different like uh, expertise. Just, <laughs> we're all just theater kids at heart, I think. Yeah, it's it's all uh, we are just a, a group of just basically insane people, and I love that. I mean, I mean. I met them, yeah. <laughs> and I see, and I mean that. And I mean that. I'm speaking to myself. And I mean that at the bottom of my heart. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a weird, fun thing that we do. And uh, but it's, it's, I've got to meet so many wonderful people through it. Like the people who play, the people behind the scenes, and the fans, and everything. That's just become this really giant family. And that's something I think I've missed more than anything else in this a year of our COVID. You know, like I just miss like being able to like hang out with y'all. And I, was, I remember when you mentioned you're like, hey, you want to come on a podcast or like a YouTube show? I don't even know what you call it. You want to like come on this thingy and talk Christmas? And I'm like, yes, I do. Rachel Silvestrini, I miss very much. Yes, I do. I miss our hugs. Oh my god, you 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 are an amazing hugger. You hug with the with the fullness of of life experience. Because so every hug mattered, and you knew it mattered, and you never waste a hug. And that's something that's a very special quality. Thank you. Yeah, I, I like to make sure that people don't hug me until they actually fully hug me back. Um, because you can tell the fakers. There you can tell the uh, yeah, the, or the, oh, one, the yeah, ones yeah. I hate. I hate, I hate the bro hugs where it's like I'm hugging you, but bam, 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 I'm hitting you. Like, make up your mind. Do you want to fight or do you want to cuddle? Because I'm a cuddler. I'm not a fighter, 
So just leave off my back, okay? My back hurts enough as it is. I'm in my late thirties now. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's a time for for the the excitable like slap hug. Like, if you want to match, mm. that's totally fine. But like, if I'm coming in and we're like greeting each other, I'm going to want a hug. Like, like a proper hug. hug. Yeah. yeah. Like, if you want to beat me up, just do it at the table. Like, don't <laughs> fucking, don't hit me because I hit back hard. No. Uh, yeah, I'll, that I don't doubt in any way, shape, or form. Nobody screws with this. If this was an actual, if, if the Schmodown was an actual fight club, oh. you're one of the people I've got my money on. Oh, I would be the Dan Merle of yeah. this league. I seriously, I there aren't a lot of people who I think would even put up much of a fight. Because let's be honest here, we're movie nerds. We're here because we don't do sports. Like, that's what we do. Like, we're just like, I was, are you going to get in a fight? No, I haven't used my forearms in a year. Like, I mostly watch movies. I don't really, I don't do one of the, like, if it was a Disney cartoon, I'd do this and then it would sag downward, you know? Yeah, yeah like that. Like, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. For me, it's, uh, fighting is uh, uh, a matter of who can give up first. Yes. That's that's what it is a matter of for me. I, I like this suggestion for next season from Chris, Rachel mm. the Hug, Silvestrini. Yeah, I really yeah. I like that. Um we did we did have um somebody send in uh, uh movie Fenobi sent in uh oh. Streamlabs earlier. Right. He can't make the show because he's oh. just been had a crazy right. week, but he sent in uh well hello Rachel, Mr. Beast, Bibbs, you sweet man. Never uh -huh. change the code, the core of who you are. I'm not spoiling just in case. After the match, your exchange with Mark was honest and sincere. You're one of the good ones. Mm -hmm. Say hi to Luca and friends, Steve. And honestly, mm -hmm. like, <sighs> that whole talk you guys had afterwards, like, I'm sitting uh -huh. there, like, crying. And my mom looks over at me. She's like, why are we crying? I'm like, because they're so good. Oh, and that was a hell of a thing. And obviously... Can we talk spoilers? I mean, it's, it's sports. We're supposed yeah, to like no, know. Yeah. Spoilers, yeah. Okay. So <laughs> if, if anyone's concerned, sorry. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you know, I uh, it sucks to lose. We all we've all lost. Uh, uh, even Adam Collins has lost in a team's match now. So we've all lost. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it it's better to lose to someone who you care about and who really like deserves it. And obviously that's the odd couple, but in particular for me, Mark and Draco and I, you know, we started our, our career together, like in the same match. And for whatever reason, even though he's amazing, he's never beat me in like competitive play. He beat me in like one exhibition once, but like, that's it. So I, it really bummed me out that like after all of these times, all these times we faced each other, he finally beat me and I couldn't give him a hug and congratulate him. Like it really pissed me off. And I, it was at that moment I started like, I got sentimental just because the whole year I've been like, I've been, I'm kind of a homebody anyway. So like a lot of the year hasn't even felt that different, but mm -hmm. it's that kind of moment that you realize just how much we've been missing. And I just got completely overwhelmed by it. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're normally we could be home for six days a week, but we know that every Saturday we're going to mm. go into that studio. We're going to get to see our friends. Yep. We're going to hug each other and bullshit with each other and go out for a drink or just hang out afterwards and spend the day together. It's literally a play date for all, for like these crazy adults. Yeah. Uh, not having that is just, it's been really hard. Like, luckily, yeah. I got to live out most of the year with uh, Brandon and Alex. So it was like, it was nice having that camaraderie. And like, you know, we were constantly talking strategy and stuff. And like, you know, fighting online. <laughs> we were literally like sitting shoulder to shoulder. And people were like, hey, you live together. And I'm like, I know our hips are touching right now. Like, <laughs> I actually we're, didn't know that. That's funny. We're, um, we're, we're splitting a chocolate bar. Like, we, we understand. <laughs> We're, 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 it's weird to me to find out because now that we've actually like had this like digital year, we've seen uh, what everyone's house looks like. 
Uh, we've seen, we've gotten to meet everyone's pets. You know, everyone who had a dog got to bring their dog into the Schmodown at one time. I had dog plans. I was gonna, I had dog entrances worked out and I just had to borrow someone's dog. And then I, but I could never bring my cats cause they're cats and it's kind of cruel and it would be a bad idea. And they probably get scared and run. And so I'd never seriously considered it, even though I always thought it'd be really cute. And I've gotten to involve my cats more this year. So that's been really nice. Yeah, the cats um, have been fun. We've also gotten to see kids, people's kids, and like meet yeah. their families and stuff, which was really sweet and nice. It is. Um, but I do miss, I do miss the whole like waking up super early. Well, super early for me because I'm yeah. still on theater time, even though it's been two years. Um, yeah. You wake up early, you get dressed, pack all your stuff that you're going to need that day, go into the studio, and as soon as you get in, somebody is like within five seconds, somebody greets you. Yeah, and you're part of a conversation, and you're still holding all your stuff. Like I just, I'm, I miss it. I love I miss- that. I love that you're one of the people who who has the stuff because we all have schmodown stuff. Like my car, my back seat of my car, half of it is still filled with schmodown props, and half of my trunk is still filled with schmodown props. Yeah, some of which have been used, some of which I have had not had the opportunity to use yet, but they're there in case I need them. And right? often they're just, it's good to just have props all of a sudden because like, someone always run in, oh, does anyone have three masks? Why, yes, I do. Yes, I do. So. <laughs> Funny, you should ask. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, I, why, I remember I had, I, I, I had a, yeah, I had a massive tote bag that had like, like, uh, like a, a hairbrush, a hairspray, like makeup specifically for the Schmodown, uh, wardrobe changes, like wardrobe tape. Like it, it, there's so much that goes into it. And then you like feel like you're just moving in every Saturday. And then like, oh, we should have got, I, honestly, the next studio, I want lockers. So we can just like leave our shit there. Thank you. We had lockers, I think, in like the first couple of seasons when I was there. And then we just didn't anymore because we moved around a lot and it sucked. But um, yeah, I still have a realist. And I worry about this getting, you know, uh, uh, going wrong someday. But I still have a semi-realistic fake chainsaw and a big old bag of red of uh, fake blood just in my car I mean, for emergencies. I, I don't see that going well ever yeah. i see it going i see it going wrong in the best way well but <laughs> hey how did bibs die well funny you should ask uh he got he got pulled over for a for a broken turn signal and it went bad um <laughs> there was blood fake blood yeah. leaking from his trunk they pulled yep. him over he's on a chainsaw it was a whole thing it was a whole thing blaze of glory uh uh, I am looking forward to hopefully studio because we're all eager to get back into a studio as soon as it's safe to do so. And I'm eager to see what that's going to look like and what that space is going to be like. And hopefully we can do some really fun theatrical stuff because not being able to do entrances this year has been really hard for yeah. me. Yeah. Really difficult, like really pissing me. I got to do one fun one where we brought in Lon uh, to like show up to the match. Oh, that was for, so like much. prepared for the first time, which he was really gung ho about. Uh, so that was really, really fun. But that was like the, the oh, and I guess kind of when like you know the kid had been like turned into a delinquent by Lon, that was kind of cute. But like it wasn't like the elaborate kind of thing we used yeah. to do. It was more yeah. of a sketch than it was like an entrance. Yeah, but like yeah, exactly, it's one of those things like you, you got an itch and you itch it however you, you can, you know, like yeah. you just you, you try and ugh, yeah. I've never been able to pull off a spectacular entrance, like an entrance at spectacular, like I wanted to. Like I had all these plans for the last year's spectacular, and I ended up shooting myself in the foot so hard because we had that fan expo like right. beforehand, and I really didn't modulate like my energy well enough, and I was giving like 110 percent of that, and then I just started, and this is all on me. I just started crashing. I'm like, oh crap, I may have put too much energy into the socializing because I'm, I'm, I'm outgoing, but it takes effort. Yeah. And so I was just starting to get tired way too soon. And so both of my entrances for spectacular were just not amazing. And then we had a big thing planned for this year and it ended up kind of not working. So we ended up just cutting it. And um, what are you going to do? Yeah. Yeah. 
I haven't had to worry about a spectacular entrance, nor do I think I will. Um, oh, give it time. Give it time. Come on. I can't wait to be like the old broad of the movie <laughs> trivia. Show down. I'm just sitting back with my like jug of wine and like a mm. cigarette. Just be like, honey, you think uh, you got it tough. Uh, let me tell you about the day guy beat up Merle. <laughs> I was there. Uh, I was three feet away from it. Oh my God. Actually, yeah, no. Oh, no. Wait, no. You can see Stop. the blood fly across <laughs> the room. Um. <laughs> I can't even. I can't even imagine. Like, like it, it's been so long since we've touched each other that, like, I can't even like, well, like you know, been yeah. face to like hug or like you yeah. know, touch someone's arm. But like, just the thought of somebody tackling somebody else right now for storyline is like insane to me we didn't have a tackle this year that was like a spectacular tradition two years running I and I, I kept expecting them to do something with it and i, mean, I was like technically hmm. guy got kidnapped so i guess kind of like i don't know I, re- I wish i'd thought of it earlier because i would have like i don't know i would have like engineered it with them and like tackled and draco and like sent him some fishing line <laughs> you know, like, oh, I tackled in Draco, so it's fine. He's just like, what the hell is this? And like, that would have been the whole bit. Like, it would have been, that been, been funny. so funny. People uh, would have been like, blink, 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 blink. And I would have been like, five people who got it. That's a joke for the five people who get it. And those people will love it so much that it's totally worth it. And it would, I would probably want a shirt from it too. Oh, God. The big yeah. tackle with just like, uh, we, uh, we need well, more. We need more shirts. That's for sure. We, we do. Well, going yeah. b- going back to your question, what was uh what what is one thing that you do that oh. always makes Christmas feel like Christmas? Uh, for me, it's uh, there's there's you know we all watch like Christmassy things around Christmas. If you like Christmassy things around Christmas, uh, but and I and I rotate it out every year. I usually don't watch the same things over and over again. But there's one movie I watch every single year, and until I watch it, it doesn't feel like the Christmas season. And I've never pushed it further than Christmas Eve. So that was like a really rough year. Uh, but uh, Christmas in Connecticut, starring Barbara Stanwyck. Okay. It's my favorite Christmas movie by far. And I love it to pieces. And I always notice something different and weird in it every single time. And um, it's just a strange, unexpected Christmas movie that used to be considered a well-established classic. Now I think it's considered a little more obscure. Yeah. Um, but I love it to pieces. If anyone's never seen it, uh, it's um, it opens amazingly because it opens with like a battleship being sunk in World War II. And you're just like, what the hell kind of Christmas movie is this? And then there's like two guys starving to death in a lifeboat for weeks. And then like they end up uh, uh, at a hospital and they're being like nursed back to health. But the one guy can't get the food he wanted because he heroically gave up his food to the other guy in the lifeboat. So he can't get good food, and he and this all ends up leading to him like accidentally, uh, like convincing a nurse he's in love with her so he can get better stuff on the menu. But now she wants to marry him, and he's like, eh, "No," and she's like, "I know what I can do. If I can convince him that a home life is really great, we can have a great life together." And so she eat she she almost said emails. So she this is a movie from the nineteen forties. Uh, she mails a publishing magnate whose son she nursed back to health and uh, she, or grandson, I guess. And she's just like, hey, you know that Martha Stewart type lady, even though Martha Stewart doesn't exist yet, but cut me some slack. <laughs> I need the re- frame of reference for people. Uh, you know that Martha Stewart type lady who writes for one of your magazines? Could she like host this like World War II hero for a publicity stunt? And the dude's like, hell yeah. Only problem is that Martha Stewart type lady is a fraud and she can't <gasps> cook and she can't clean and she doesn't live in like a farmhouse in the country. She lives in like a <laughs> studio apartment in New York and she's just been lying her head off this whole time. And so in order to keep this lie going and they try to weasel out of it, but they just can't. Um, they have, to, she has to agree to marry a guy, move into his farmhouse, find a way to borrow a real life baby, pretend she knows how to cook. And on top of it all, once she meets the World War II hero, after she's already met this guy and said, I'll, I'll agree to marry you if you let me use your farmhouse for my 
from my charade. She completely falls in love with this World War II hero. And they spend the entire movie like flirting with each other, even though he thinks she's married and she thinks he's the kind of guy who would totally fuck someone who's married. And it's really kind of <laughs> twisted and wrong. It's great. It's really fun. It's really, really weird. And, but the weirdest thing about it, and people don't know this, or a lot of people don't know this anyway, is that it had a remake in, I think, the early 1990s. And guess who directed the remake? Gary Marshall? That is too good a guess. Consider a worse guess. Um, Someone who Robert. would not do this. <laughs> Robert Redford. <laughs> He's um, always my go-to now. <laughs> okay, even worse. Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'm sorry, what? Arnold Schwarzenegger has directed only one feature film in his entire career, and it was a made-for-TV remake of Christmas in Connecticut starring Chris Christopherson, Diane Cannon, and Tony Curtis. I don't know either. I don't know. I, um, I want to know what drugs the TV exec was on that approved this. Right? And it, the remake isn't particularly good. It's got it's got its charm, that kind of made-for-TV remake charm. But, like, I don't know. Every once in a while, it's just like, well, who can we get? I don't know. I hear Arnold Schwarzenegger wants to direct. Can we get Arnold Schwarzenegger? We won't know until we try. And it turns out Arnold is, a, I don't know if he's a big fan of the movie or he just wanted to break out of his wheelhouse or he wanted to direct, but he wanted his first feature to be something with low expectations. Or he was really fucking bored. <laughs> might have been, might have been. I don't know. He was toying with directing around that time. He directed a pretty good episode of Tales from the Crypt about an old man who, um, he was an old man. He was a really, really old man, and he had like a trophy wife, and he wanted to basically can get a mad scientist to like switch bodies between him and like a bodybuilder, and of course, it all goes horribly wrong. Um, but uh, yeah, wait, it's, it's not a badly directed movie. That's that's not the movie's problem, but it's really, really weird. And if you can track it down, it's okay. But um, as far as made for TV remakes of classic Christmas movies go, it's lower echelon. Uh, did you ever see the gender swapped made for TV remake of It's a Wonderful Life? No, yeah, uh, it's called It Happened, huh. it happened One Christmas. And it stars Marlo Thomas from That Girl. And Orson Welles plays Mr. Potter, which is actually pretty good casting. And the angel is played by Cloris Leachman. Oh, oh I love her. <laughs> we got, she, was, she was nominated for an Emmy for this performance. Uh, Marlo Thomas plays the Jimmy Stewart role. And it's basically the same movie. But what's interesting is that the, it, this movie was made in the 1970s. And for a long time, it was really hard to find. Now, it's, I think you can find it on streaming services pretty easily. But... Uh, uh, the the movie It's a Wonderful Life, people sometimes forget now, wasn't a huge hit no. and it wasn't especially popular for many decades. And it wasn't until the movie started airing on TV mm -hmm. constantly that people started saying, you know, this movie is actually really good. And one of the reasons why the movie had this like sudden cachet to air on TV more often is because they did this made for TV remake. Interesting. Yeah, this, I actually think Orson Welles and Cloris Leachman are particularly good in it. I mean, I love Orson Welles, and first, like, Cloris Leachman and Betty White are, like, my goals for when I grow up. <laughs> um, actually, Cloris Leachman went to school with my grandmother wow. kindergarten through senior year of high school, and, like, they were, like, best friends, apparently, and I did not find this out until my grandmother was, like... Oh in her late seventies. And I was like, Evelyn, why how are you, you just telling me this now? How are you not telling me these wonderful stories? I remember when I was in college, I found out that my mom, because my mom didn't date a lot before she met, met my dad and married him. Like she doesn't have like a storied romantic history. Uh, so it was a real shock to find out that one of the very few people she dated before she met and fell in love with my dad was Ralph Nader. And I was <laughs> like, what? Mom, I am 19 years old. How has this not come up yet? And she's like, I don't know. I don't really think about it. Oh Why the God. hell not? <laughs> Why would this never, ever come up? What are you doing to me? That's so crazy. Yeah, no, really I, I, I remember every time after she told me, I went, like, we because we would spend Thanksgiving mm -hmm. uh, with my mom's side because my grandfather's birthday was November 28th. 
Yeah. So my mom is one of five kids. I'm one of 15 grandkids on my mom's side. Ooh. So as many people as possible would get together for Thanksgiving and we'd all have Thanksgiving together. And then the Friday after Thanksgiving, we'd go out for Mexican food for my grandfather's birthday. That's nice. But it was very sweet. Yeah. Um, Sadly, since uh, both of them have passed, but every mm-hmm. year that I would see, every time I would see my grandmother, I'm like, do you want me to track down Chloris for you? Because I will do this on behalf of you. <laughs> the only cavet, the only, the only issue is that I have to be the one to take you to go meet up with her because wow. I need to meet the heroine of my life. Like I mm-hmm. love Chloris Leishman. Uh, I know Perry just did an interview with uh, Christine Bransky and like. Mm-hmm. That's an amazing, that's an amazing woman. I was like, legitimately, I've been in love with her since I first saw her as Marianne walking around Sybil's house with a sports bottle full of marshmallows. <laughs> oh, she's, she's, she's a goddess. That's so cool. I was just thinking, um, I, I, my first time I went to Comic-Con, I, uh, I got to meet, I got to meet one of my idols. I got to meet Cassandra Peterson herself, Elvira. Oh my gosh, she's so El- sweet. <laughs> Elvira is one of the coolest human beings Ever and I don't just mean Cassandra Peterson. I also mean Elvira, well, uh, yeah. and I'm a huge fan. And her movie Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, I think is an unsung comedy classic. Um, and I met her and I thought she was really cool. And when I ta- when I called my parents like later that weekend, I just to check in. I was like, Hey, just letting you know everything's fine here. I met Elvira, and she's like, Oh, did you tell her we said hi? And I said, What? And I'm like, Yeah, we used to be neighbors. <gasps> what? What? <laughs> How has this never come up? Come on. I had an in with Elvira. I had an in. What are you doing to me? You could have taken her out for a drink. Oh my god. Ugh. I would have I would have settled for like a for like a one of those like ten dollar cookies they have. Just like, hey, you want me to get you a ten dollar cookie, Elvira? And Elvira would be like, hey. And I would have been like, cool, Elvira, we're friends now. And she's like, no, we're not. And I'm like, okay. And I still got her the cookie because I'm a nice guy. She's uh, really awesome. I got to meet, uh, I can never remember his name because mm. he always giggled when I would, I, okay. So I had, I went to um, Full Moon Horror and Tattoo Expo in Nashville uh, yeah. when I was living there. Uh, and a friend of mine is, uh, she's an actress and she's in a ton of like B-horror movies. Mm-hmm. He admits they like, but like they're really funny. Um, so I went to go meet up with her. She's in the bar of the hotel hanging out with the original Jason. And I well, can never remember his name. Do you remember the original original Jason? Like the one who was like the kid in the first movie? Or are you talking about the guy who was in all the Jason movies like Kane Hodder? All the Jason movies. I think Paul. you're thinking of Kane Hodder. Yes. Okay, that's cool. So he was there and I remember just walking in and just being like very few times have I had this reaction where I just walk in and I'm like, Oh my God, you're Jason. And he just started laughing. I'm like, I'm really sorry. I know you have a name. He's like, no, you can call me Jason. It's fine. And I'm like, all right, cool. Um, Now I'm going to bother learning your name. And then we got drunk and became, uh, we came up with a horrible, horrible horror movie uh, concept uh, called uh, the killer was called the sniffer and he could smell sins. uh, And the sequel was going to be called resnifercation. Uh, we had literally came up with like, we, we got very, very drunk at this hotel bar. Um, oh there was like literally a table of like 10 of us. And we came, we came up with like a script and a, like plot bases for like three different movies all in this. It was ridiculous, but he was so sweet. So big. I don't think I've ever met Jane Hodder, but he always seemed really cool. Yeah. That's cool, man. Well, speaking of horror, you are a massive horror fan. Uh, yeah. And you're a big Christmas movie fan. So what are your favorite Christmas horror movies? Okay, well, there's the obvious ones and then there's the less obvious ones. And a lot of the obvious ones are obvious because they're great. Like right. the original, like the original Gremlins is a, a classic Christmas movie and a classic horror movie. Uh, the original Black Christmas is yes. considered one of the like formative slasher movies it's hard to pin down the exact creation of the slasher i would argue that the slasher wasn't like codified until halloween like all the rules are definitely in place but there's definitely antecedents um but i like a lot of the other christmas horror movies people don't talk about very much uh let's see uh i think both the black christmas remakes are fun uh, I think the early 2000s one is a mess, but at the very least, it is 
like balls to the wall crazy. Like it's yeah. super bizarre. Um, I think the new Black Christmas, uh, it has some, I think it has some actual just problems like with the narrative, but I do think that it actually captures modern dialogue and the way that people speak casually about politics, especially young people, mm -hmm. um, in a way that I don't see other movies doing. I remember looking at that movie and like, I, cause I remember when Scream came out and I remember thinking to myself, wow, a movie that actually like gets how people in my generation are talking right now. We talk with movie references is not well, just, I mean, you know. Kev Kevin Williamson also wrote it and he wrote and he created Dawson's Creek. So like that was go. not too big of a shocker for me, but like, right. And I, I, rem I know that the the original Black Christmas was so ahead of its time about like abortion and yeah. female, like rights and all that. Like it's if you, I remember going back and watching it for the first time and just being like, wow, this is heavy. And it really pissed me off when people were talking about the most recent Black Christmas and saying like, whoa, why'd you get political? Why why'd you have to make Black Christmas about politics? And I'm like. <laughs> Have you seen the original? It's about a woman who is basically fighting for her right to choose and how her boyfriend is desperately trying to control her body to the extent where at the end, if he isn't the killer, then the movie is arguing that there's functionally no difference. Yeah. That's what that's how political that movie is. And it's a great motion picture. It's really fantastic. It really is. I mean, you could yeah. you could almost take away all of the death and just make a movie about that and it would like and just edit it down and it would have been just as amazing all those um, characters in that movie are really strong margot kidder is uh, hilarious in that movie uh they're all really 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 good is it olivia hussey yes yeah, olivia hussey yeah. from romeo and juliet uh she's fantastic in it um Every in high school i'm sorry in, what was that I said it was the very first pair of breasts that everybody saw in a movie during high school. Um, yeah, for some reason you were allowed to watch that in classes. And uh, I, I, I mean, because whatever, it it's art. actually pretty chaste, but yeah. I know, yeah. They, were, they were like, it's art. And I'm like, great, can we watch the Boz Lerman one? They're like, no, it's too violent. I'm like, we literally just saw butt crack. Like, It's got the same body count. Right? It's not the same body count. I don't know what the difference is. Plus That's Leo ridiculous. and Claire and John Leguizamo. Like, give me this. <laughs> yeah, come on, man. Um, it's been so long since we've had, like, we've only had, like, two good Romeo and Juliet's ever on film. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I like uh, th those are all good movies. I think the new ones are really underrated, and I think it's going to find its audience over time. Um, there's a really, there's a couple of really fucking weird cults horror movies set at Christmas that people don't really talk about much anymore. Or they're starting to maybe now uh, there's a movie called, I think it's called blood beat, uh, which is about a family going to like a farmhouse for Christmas. And they accidentally awaken the ghost of a serial killer samurai. Uh, that's like a good you, one. Like and you it, do. And it turns out mom's like a wizard or whatever. And she never, she kind of forgot to mention it before. Um, then there's a movie that I love. It's so wrong. Everything about this movie doesn't work. Uh, it's called Elves. Have you ever seen Elves? I, th I, th I like, as soon as you said it, I like got an image of this VHS cover that I would uh -huh. always see it like blockbuster. Mm -hmm. Was oh it like of a Christmas God. tree and a box and like an evil hand coming out of the box? Yeah. Yeah. That's Elves. Uh, elves is the story of one elf. Uh, so already we're off to a bad start. Uh, and it starts with a group of teenage girls who have ventured off into the woods uh, to perform uh, a satanic ritual to bring forth the anti-Christmas. Uh, this is never mentioned again. They never, this isn't part of their characters. This isn't important. They just accidentally raise an evil elf. And then they go back about their business working at a department store where Grizzly Adams is a former murder detective who has hit hard times and is now like working in the store. And he ends up investigating a series of murders by this one elf who, and I don't want to ruin all the movie's twists because there's a ton of twists and most of them will make you just rip out your hair going, what? <laughs> but I will say this, the evil elf in this movie was created by Nazis during World War II. Naturally. Yeah, that's just one one little tiny step on sounds, the elves' weirdness. It sounds very familiar to yoga hosers. 
But you instead know, of Broadbeans, it's an elf. You're actually not that far off, to be perfectly oh. honest. I wouldn't be surprised if Kevin Smith had seen it. Now I kind of wish I'd asked him that when I interviewed him about yoga hoses. Um, <laughs> but uh, there's also a really cool one. This one's actually starting to get a bit of a cult, and I think this one is available on Shudder. Um, I, I'm trying to think what it's called. It's had a lot of different names. The name that I know it best under is called Dial Code Santa Claus, uh, oh. which is about a little kid trapped in his house at Christmas alone trying to fight off home invaders. Except oh. it came out a, it came out before Home Alone and the Santa Claus who's trying to break in is a homicidal maniac. Huh. It's really cool and <laughs> it's totally totally the sort of thing people need to see more of and it recently it like it barely ever if if it even did get released in America. And I think partly because people were just like, it's going to compete with Home Alone. We don't want it. Uh, but like late in the last few years, it started to pick up steam as like a cult classic. And I hope you check it out and other people check it out because it's a lot of fun. It's a yeah. really, really badass movie. Well, I had one movie that I was, it, it had been recommended by friends, but like they hadn't really pushed. They're like, you should see this. I'm like, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll see it eventually. Like, you know, wasn't really big on horror until I like took a really big deep dive into it for the horror free for all, even though I crashed yeah. over it. Um, as expected. Um, but I was real, like, I remember watching this movie the first time and instantly, as soon as it was over, called all of my friends who recommended it and yelled at them for not making me watch it. And that's Krampus. And when that was what? Krampus. Oh, Krampus is really good. I love that movie. It is Krampus. so much fun. It is so yeah. well written. The characters are great. It's kind of an all star cast, too. Like, yeah. It's got, got Tony Collette. You got um, Adam Scott. Scott, thank you. I almost said Adam Witt, and I was like, that's not right. <laughs> that uh, would be great casting. Yeah, no, that'd be good. Just those two alone, you got you got me in your movie. But, like, yeah, that's a really clever movie. They think out the whole, like, what would an evil Christmas look like? Like, everything about Christmas is evil now. Yeah. And it's a real treat. I, I really do love that movie a lot. And actually, I think it's a good double feature with – um the first Goosebumps movie, which is way better than it has any right to be. I love those. I, even the second one, I like. The second the one really good. The second one is is a. I think it covers too much of the same ground as the original because it kind of yeah. just turns into the same thing over and over again. But it's still okay. But like that first one is really clever. It's got some really good characters in it, and yeah, it's it's a kids movie clearly, but they're not afraid to let horror be scary. It's, how I feel about Krampus. Krampus isn't like the most like wickedly violent horror ever, but the scariest are legitimately creepy. Like, yeah, I the box that Jack box was scared the crap out of me. Yeah, right. Well, first of all, I hate clowns. Um, they scare the crap out of me. It, uh, the mini series of it ruined me for yeah. life for clowns. Uh, made me terrified. Um. But yeah, dude, I, I don't know what it is. Like the, something, the, I, I loved how Goosebumps itself was made with like the parents in mind by referencing all these books. Cause like we grew up reading every book yeah. that RL9 ever released. Like as soon as the new Goosebumps came out, like no, like kids these days do not understand how amazing the Scholastic Book Fair was because you got to load up on all of the Goosebump books that you could. Well, we, had, uh, we, had, we had Goosebumps and there was also uh, Animorphs. Oh, Those the were Animorphs, big, like yeah. around the same time. Like there were these whole like, it was like Twilight, but somehow they came out every three weeks. Like yeah. it was incredible. Yeah. They were, yeah, they came out with like the, the same consistency that like smut romance books do. Like just constantly, yeah. just 30 a year. Yeah. Just give them to me. Totally yeah. fine. Uh, no, I, I, I never love... got into the Animorphs, but anytime I hear someone describe them, I'm like, that is the most batshit thing I think I've ever heard. How did no one tell me to read Animorphs when I was a kid? Because I thought it was like this cute thing about people who turn into animals. And then, ah, no, it turns out it's really dark and fucked up. Yeah, I used to read them to uh, uh, a kid I used to babysit who's now ah. legally able to drink, which makes me feel ancient. Um, I'm, not down. I'm not okay with it at all. <laughs> no, at all. Um, but he was a good kid, so we would read through them, and I would literally, like, I remember him, like, falling asleep while I was reading them, and I would just keep sitting in his room, like, with the light low, just reading his books. <laughs> I'm like, hey, uh, like, I remember his mom came home one time, and I was like, hey, Maria, uh, uh, Ari says he needs this book, and it was because he didn't have it, and I wanted to read it. 
but we run it together, so it's fine. That's sweet. That's really, really nice. I, I never got into the same series of books that other people I knew did. Like, I, I read a few Goosebumps here and there, but I wasn't obsessed with Goosebumps. And the what the series that I got into that no one else gave a crap about was the Enchanted Forest Chronicles. Did you remember this at all? By Patricia oh. C. Reed. It's great. They're really, really wonderful. Uh, and it's uh, the first book is called Dealing with Dragons. And it is about a, uh, a feminist princess who doesn't want anything to do with this whole, you have to learn how to like be, you know, to bake and be the perfect wife. And she's like, I have been secretly taking fencing classes since I was three. That's and I kind of just not into it. And, but she's stuck. There's protocol. There's only, she's, she's stuck in this arrangement. I was just like, like, and if I was to get her head, I could get kidnapped by a dragon. But that doesn't really happen that often. So I Oh no, I lost you. Or did you lose me? Are you there? Sorry, you went, you went, uh, all I heard was robot noises for like a minute. And now you're gone. There you are. Okay, great. Okay, cool. Sorry. Sorry. For some reason, it was just started like sounding like a robot, and I was like, "No, I want to hear about this book." I'm she sounds sorry. like she sounds like Merida meets uh, Hiccup. A little bit, actually. Yeah, it's a really, really cute book, and and then over the course of new books, there are new adventures. I think there's four books and some short stories, nice. uh, but they're really delightful, and no one talks about them, and I like them a lot, and. I don't know. Sometimes I pondered like, oh, I wish I could make movies out of the dealing with dragon stories. And I'm like, I don't know if they're going to spend like a hundred million dollars to CG animate a dragon who like hangs out, drinks tea and eats cherries Jubilee. Like, I just don't think that's a, they're going <laughs> to, they're going to want to spend the money on it, which is a shame. I think. Yeah. I never say like, I was an avid reader as a child. Like I was reading probably like at a high school level by the time I was in third grade, like I was just constantly consuming books. Like I love reading. I love books. And so like my dad brought home the series one time called the immigrants by Howard fast. And it's a historical fiction mm. about the history of California. Oh, I don't know this one. That's cool. Told by told, told through like the uh, three families. Huh? Um, and it's, you know, the, the patriarch of the family is Dan and he's uh, an Italian immigrant that, you know, was born on the train on as their parents were coming out west to like mine for gold. And uh, they called they named him Dan because he was born in, in a den of lions and uh, and all that stuff. And it was it's fascinating. It like tells you all, it like, covers, you know, the earthquake of 1908 in yeah. San Francisco and like the creation of cinema because one of one of the family's daughters comes down to LA to like be in movies and it covers uh World War II and the creation of like aircraft and the Bank of America forming of the Bank of America and like uh, uh well, that sounds very informative. What that sounds like it makes learning fun. It was but it it, it, yeah. it was I mean it it's, it was very loosely based around like it was like oh let's hit the high spots of the history of california but like told through these amazing families and like it's just it's beautiful i absolutely love that that and the clan of the cave bear or was it the children of earth series by jane m owl uh because they did that one it's a lot <laughs> <laughs> you gotta you gotta really want to get through these books because she researched clan of the cave bears for 20 years before she wrote it because she wanted it to be so incredibly historically accurate uh -huh. with like cavemen and like the Neanderthals and stuff like that. And like, you know, she, she spends like three pages describing roots and herbs and, you know, barks and medicines and things you can use them for. And I was like, you know what, if I'm ever on a, on a deserted Island, that's what I want with me. I want to know how I'm going to fucking live. 
There you go. Of course, there's a part of me that wants to be like, you know, you can use your imagination. <laughs> That's fun too. Um, True. It is always cool to see people who like who do the research and how that research actually like informs the story. It does kind of bug me though when it feels like an author is like done the research but there was no organic place in the story so one character says did you know that uh, cavemen actually invented the cell phone that's true <laughs> and uh 3000 bc they uh, turned a rock into a, a thing and i'm like does this have anything to do with anything plot wise thematically no i just did the research and i wanted it to go somewhere I mean, luckily it does tie in because the main girl, Isla, uh, who's played by Daryl Hannah in the movie, oh, yeah. um, becomes like she she gets taken in. Uh, her entire tribe dies in an earthquake and she lives as a child and gets adapted or adopted into this um, into this tribe of uh, Neanderthals. And hmm. the, the medicine woman takes her in. And so she starts teaching her how to use everything for medicine. And it's fascinating. But it's like. After a while, you're like, oh, my God, get to the plot again, please. Yeah. Like, she can only go searching for berries and twigs for so long. But I think it's actually, beautiful. Did you? I actually never saw the movie. Did you see the movie? Was it any good? No. Okay. <laughs> I think it's always interesting to me how, like, the caveman, like, idea has, like, never, and at least that I can think of. Someone please correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think it's ever made a good movie. Like, there's never been, like, a good caveman movie. Like, yeah. you know, the Flintstones, not good. Also, not even really what I'm talking about. Uh, we had, uh, I mean, like, the opening of 2001, but that's not a whole movie. Yeah. But, like, there was that Ringo Starr movie. There was that awful Roland Emmerich movie. The closest one I can think of, and it's still not a good movie, did you ever see Teenage Caveman, directed by Roger Corman? No. Okay. Roger Corman, for anyone who's listening who doesn't know, uh, king of the schlock. He figured out how that uh, people liked seeing schlock. Monster movies, movies with attractive people with various states of undress. And he would make them super cheap and he'd make a ton of money and he would give many of the most talented filmmakers in the world today their first chance to make movies, uh, including like Francis Ford Coppola, Martin Scorsese, uh, James Cameron. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, he directed a ton of schlocky movies. Some of them were actually kind of good. Uh, one of them was called Teenage Caveman, and it starred Robert Vaughn, who was not a teenager, nor did he look even remotely like a teenager. But we're going to let that go. It's called acting. <laughs> Robert Vaughn plays a caveman, and all of the other cavemen and cave women and all the cave persons are just like, we have these rules that we abide by. We never leave the valley. We never question things. Science, who's he? Like, no, we don't do any of that crap. We just sit here in our cave and we be miserable and then we die. And that's the rule. And he's like, well, what if we didn't do that? And they're like, blasphema. And I'm going to ruin this movie for you because there's no reason to see it unless you know the twist. He finally like rebels so hard that he like goes off to explore the world. And of course, there's like dinosaurs and shit and it's like iguanas with like little spines like taped to their <laughs> back going Rah! and it's adorable but uh, then he runs into a monster like a man-sized monster is trying to kill him. and uh, after he kills the monster he sees and he has no context for this and only the audience gets it uh, that the monster is a guy in a radiation suit and it's actually not the ancient past it's the distant future after we nuked the world and we nuked the world because science ran amok and all of the caveman beliefs that they had were specifically designed to make sure no one ever invented nuclear bombs again. So this sounds like the village meets planet of the apes. A little bit. Yeah. And what's interesting is that that's also sounds very much like a twilight zone episode. And this movie yeah. does predate the twilight zone. Now, Honestly, granted, that, yeah. So Honestly, granted, that kind of thing existed, but yeah. One one of the one of the one one of the Twilight Zone episodes that actually like shook me to my core the most was the uh, the toy drive episode. Which, oh, you the one where they're all stuck in that cylinder. Yeah. yeah, that's a great one, dude. That fucks with your head. I, I have to agree with Jedi McPimp. Encino Man did do. It's okay. It's okay. It's it's tricky though because that's technically not so much like 
a caveman movie as much as it is a high school movie with a caveman in it. But, but it's, it's, the closest, it's, and it's, it's the closest exception I can get. And I will say this. No one, and I mean no one, does fish out of water caveman type stuff better than Brendan Fraser. You can buy Encino Man and George of the Jungle. I recently rewatched George of the Jungle, the first one. It's so good. It's so good. How is it that good? It's ridiculous that it's that good. It had no right being as good as it no. did. Neither, well, for neither movie. Like, neither movie had any right being as good as one. Encino Man was so sweet and so, like, it had such a heart to it. I love that movie. Yeah. Um, I also just have a massive soft spot in my heart for Brendan Fraser because he's wonderful and lovely. And I just Agreed. want good things for him. Same. Um, <laughs> I do. I, I I have a list of holiday movies that I've been trying to see. Have you seen Santa's sleigh? Oh, is that with Goldberg as Santa? I think so. It's a horror movie, right? Yeah. 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 I actually have seen that. I like that one a lot. Actually. That's yeah. um. He that's actually a- met his wife on that set. I didn't know that. That's cute. Uh, yeah. yeah. Goldberg, the wrestler plays an evil Santa Claus. It turns out like Santa Claus was actually like, the antichrist but he was tricked into being good for like 2000 years but now time's up and he gets to be evil again but he's been santa for so long all of his evil is santa related um it's surprisingly witty i really like that one a lot actually and then i saw um better watch out which was not what i was expecting uh, i i i have i'm frustrated by better watch out i know everyone loves this movie and I tried watching it and I got about 15 minutes into it and I just wasn't feeling it. And I found out later that the reason why I wasn't feeling it was because I guessed the twist in like the first scene. Yeah. And I was like, oh, there's a reason I hate this. Like I'm supposed to. And I'm like, oh, okay. You did your job too well. So I really just didn't feel it, but I, I'll revisit it someday. Maybe I'll give it another chance. I just, I just, I just watched it. And like, the more I watched it, the more I was filled with rage. And I was like, this is why women die because they are so afraid of offending even a prepubescent child yeah. that they're not willing to like crack this kid across the head with something and tie him up. Yeah. Like, no, stand up for yourself, girls. Yeah. Snap those creepy best and boys. Teach them with what? What what else is on your list? Um, well, I have it divided because I am psychotic. So I have my horror movies. I have uh Better Watch Out, uh mm. All the Black Christmases, Krampus, yep. Gremlins, Santa Slay, Rare Exports. Great movie. For I love horror, that movie. For horror, uh for comedy and action, I have um a very Murray Christmas. I know it's not a movie, but it's mm-hmm. Bill Murray, so you have to. Uh Die Hard One and Two. Okay. El Camino Christmas, Four mm-hmm. Christmases, Surviving Christmas, The Ref, Iron Man 3, Just Friends, which is honestly one of my favorite Christmas movies wow. of all time. Okay. Uh, Christmas with the Cranks. And then let's see. There's the family movies. You're, gonna, you're actually gonna sit through Christmas with the Cranks. No, it's just on the list. Like okay. if I'm like if I need to watch if I want to put something on in the background. That is, like, that is a nails on chalkboard movie. I'm just gonna warn you that. that's that's not a great yeah. one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Arthur Christmas, Christmas, the oh. Christmas Chronicles 1 and 2. I love Arthur Christmas so much. Arthur it's one of my favorite animated movies. Arthur Christmas and, um, oh my God, what's the one that's on Netflix? Oh, uh, for, uh, Klaus. Shaun the Sheep? Klaus. Oh, Klaus. Klaus. Klaus is fantastic. That movie's so beautiful. It just, it like, yeah. I, I just cry because it's so wonderful. It's incredible. Uh, the Family Man. The Family I'm not Man. A, I'm not a fan. Really? It comes across really insincere to me. I think Taya Leone is good in that movie, but I don't like, think Brett Ratner's heart is in it. It feels and it comes up coming across kind of cynical to me. That's fair. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm I'm also just a Jeremy Piven fan for some reason. I think I find him in like sentimental movies that's like really endearing. Uh, mm-hmm. The Family Stone, which always makes me cry. Uh, Jack Frost, which is terrible. <laughs> Wait, which one? Uh, the horror movie or the family movie? Both. Okay, fair. enough. Uh, Jingle all the way, not not a fan. You know what? I I went back and watched it because uh, I remember it just being like shoved down my throat as a kid, and I'm like, I cannot watch this again. Uh, and I watched it for the first time in probably about 20 years the other night, and I was like, it's not as bad as I remember. It's not as good as everybody loves it. Like I, I don't it. love it as much as everybody else, but it's if it's on, I'll watch it. But I'm not going to like willingly put it on again. 
For me, the thing that really broke me was we did a podcast a long time ago where we had, it was called The Two Shot, and it was like, we had our listeners vote for one of the most notorious movies ever made, and then we would pick a classic movie to pair it with as a double feature. And one of my favorite episodes we ever did was they picked Jingle All the Way, and when we were watching Jingle All the Way, we realized this is a remake of Bicycle Thieves. Huh. Bicycle Thieves is, for anyone who doesn't know it, it's an Italian neorealist classic. Uh, and it is about a dad who is hunting all over town for a missing thing without which he will lose uh, his his family and his son. And uh, it has many of the same plot points. It's just that Jingle All the Way has a super bullshit, mega happy Hollywood ending. Um, but yeah, it's really eerie, actually. And I highly recommend watching them back to back someday. Interesting. I have all of the Grinch movies. Okay. Ooh. Oh, all of them? All of them. Oh. I mean, there's How the Grinch Stole Christmas. It's a yep. classic. Yeah, great. The Grinch. Nope. And Grinch. I haven't seen the new one. The new one is really sweet. I also have Here's a soft part in my heart for it because Scott Mosier directed it, and he's uh, the reason that Kevin Smith is Kevin Smith because yeah. he's the one that he met at the Vancouver Film School. I right. was like, you should make your own movie and like pushed him. And he's been in all of his movies now. Yeah. Um, and then Home Alone and Home Alone 2. Home Alone um, 5 is the good one. Did you say five? Yeah. Oh, God. I'm dead serious. I cannot watch Home Alone 1 and 2 anymore. I, I'm not a fan. I, I used to be when I was a kid. And I think that's why. I think for me, the Home Alone movies, the first two anyway, they're kid fantasies. They're kid yeah. fantasies about empowerment, about like being, you know, having the whole house to yourself, uh, about how all adults are stupid and easily tricked, or you can beat them up and no one cares. Yeah. Uh, and that's fine. Uh, but as an adult, I watch them and there's a lot I just can't get past. For one thing, the plotting in the first one is really quite bad. And secondly, I think in the second one, Kevin is an asshole. <laughs> Have you noticed how awful Kevin is? Because in the first one, in the first one, he's a little kid and he thinks that his family is gone because he made a Christmas wish. Right. So he's just making the most out of what he got. I, I can live with that. There's huge plot holes with it, but I can live with that. In two, he knows he took the wrong airplane. He knows he could get back together with his parents. And instead, he lets his parents tear their heads out with worry and steals all their money, cons a lot of people, belittles the working class. Like his like relationship with Rob Schneider is like, oh, do you want like money for the services that you render? I'm gonna find a way to con that you out of that, you miserly beggar. And he Schneider's like, I just do a working class job. They're like, ah, screw you. And he's like, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Kevin. And then he like hangs out with his best friend Donald Trump, and he's just like. <laughs> He's just not a good person, man. He's just not a good person. It really bugs me. I mean, um, I, watched, I watched the first one last night, and as he's running, like as he like steals the uh, the toothbrush and runs out, yeah, I was yeah. like, my mom and I are watching. It, I'm like, oh my god, there's not a person in that town with melanin. <laughs> it's true. Like nobody even has a fucking tan. No. Look at how rich that community is that he grows up in. Oh my He's at giant houses line the street, literally all of them in this idyllic Chris Columbus fairy tale suburbia. All of them go out of town for Christmas. Mm -hmm. That is some bourgeois shit. Uh, That's that is some saying. bougie ass shit. Yeah. But how but the other how the Home Alone movies, three sucks. Oh, three is terrible. Four is worse because four actually goes back to Kevin. It's played by a new kid now, but dad like divorced his mom for a new trophy wife and she's all miserable and it, it stinks except for a uh, uh, French Stewart replaces Daniel Stern and he's actually pretty good. Uh, yeah. He's actually pretty good. I'll give him credit. It's, it, the movie isn't, can't do anything with him, but he's fine. Um, and it does actually have the redemption of buzz. Where really? Buzz actually has grown up a little bit and he shows that he's got a little bit of a heart. Different Buzz, but regardless, the character actually shows some redemption and that's actually kind of nice. But the movie is junk and it's really not worth seeing. It's just yeah, that sounds, it but sounds terrible. Home Alone 5 Holiday Heist is actually pretty good. 
It's actually like right from the get go. It's actually pretty solid. Uh, there's a good reason for the kids to be like home alone. Uh, their parents went out to a big Christmas party in like the mountains with their boss. And then there's a snowstorm and they all get snowed in. Gotcha. So they're stuck. And then Malcolm McDowell is trying to rob the place because there used to be like a prohibition era speakeasy in the basement. And there's like old like Al Capone money in there or something like that. And he's just trying to steal it. And th the story works. The writing is actually very crisp. It all of the plot holes that make home alone, like offensive to an adult sensibility are covered. It's pretty good. At the very least, it's more consistent. And so I just want to, people do not talk about it enough. Home Alone 5, not bad. I, mean, I will say be, that right now. To be fair, I stopped paying attention after three because I was like, I will never watch another movie again for, with this title um, because it was just yeah. so horrible. Also, I think I was like 20 when it came out and I'm like, I can't do this anymore. Um, yeah, they're made for little kids. They're made for little kids. Yeah, I mean they're fun. It's it's it's. I love Home Alone because I was young when it came out. I was you know I was six when it came out, mm -hmm. so I grew up. It's very nostalgic, and it, I have that emotional attachment to it. So it mm -hmm. like brings me back to that time. Totally okay. understand why pe other people don't love it, mm -hmm. but like the other ones, I, I was, that didn't exist for me. Um, so I just I don't have that attachment to that horrible of a movie of three. Um, there's some, there have been some really good adult humor ones that have come out. Um, Bad Mom's oh, Christmas yeah. is I actually haven't seen that one yet. Excellent. I mean, it's Christine Baranski, yeah, plays one of the moms, and she is perfection because she is a goddess. Agreed. Um, Bad Santa one and two. Mm, I didn't see two. Bad Santa one's okay. The night before is pretty good. Then I was getting there. The night before yeah, is like the night before and just friends are two of the movies that I will watch mm -hmm. throughout the year. If I need a laugh, like they're mm -hmm. just, they just make me laugh so hard. That is a hundred percent my type of humor. And as terrible as it was, the office Christmas party was mm. super fun. Okay. I didn't see that one either. Fair play. Yeah. My friend worked, uh, she worked uh, wardrobe on that movie and she was like, yeah, it's a terrible movie, but Joel McHale, Joel McHale is amazing. And I'm like, well, he's, it's just Joel. Like he's, <laughs> he's just wonderful. Oh, that's then, there's like, then there's like the classics. Like I didn't grow. So actually this leads to a good, good question. Is there a movie that everybody deems is like one of their favorite Christmas movies? And you're like, I just don't get it. Oh, there's a lot of movies that people just grew up with that were a little over past my time that I but they're not Christmas movies necessarily. Like I, for the life of me, I will live to be a hundred and I'll never understand what anybody sees in space jam like okay. at all. I don't get it. It's a terrible motion picture. It, it is, but it's like home alone, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's part of my childhood. Yeah. A lot of things are part of my childhood. I got beat up a lot in childhood too. That doesn't mean I have any nostalgia for it. Um, so I'm trying to think I, I well, actually we've already brought one up. Uh, the Ron Howard, Dr. Seuss. I know a lot of people grew up with that one, liking it a lot. That came out when I was, I think I was in college already. And uh, I don't think it's, I don't think it's very good. I think Jim Carrey's good in it. I think the makeup's fantastic, but uh, I think Ron Howard was uniquely ill suited to that material. Like you're going to create these giant sets of Whoville and you're going to hide them behind fog right why yeah. is everything so hard to see in this movie i want to live here like a, a not good movie but a movie with incredible production design like oh my god is it a good looking christmas movie is santa claus the movie yes that movie is it's it's not good but like the opening bit that's like the origin of santa claus which is weirdly melodramatic but it works uh <laughs> is just gorgeously realized it's like the coolest version of the north pole i've ever seen in anything so um that's one i'm trying to think what else um also no don't tell me you didn't want that hot chocolate oh yeah it's amazing um i didn't grow up I'd like there's a lot of people who grew up with the movie elf i like elf <laughs> a lot i like elf a lot i think it's a very sweet movie it's not a perennial for me it's just oh okay. elf is on okay cool I got nothing against Elf, but I don't have like this giant affinity for Elf. I just think it's just another movie uh, that's set at Christmas and it's pretty good. Um, I'm trying to think. I'm actually looking over a bit of a list of uh, of Christmas movies right here to see if anything. Um, this is one that I actually just saw for the first time like a week ago, and I love it. 
But for years, I heard people talk about how much of a modern Christmas classic The Holiday is. It's so good. It's really cute. I'm really hot or cold on Nancy Myers. Like I, she, she can do wonderful things and she can do really bad things. I mean, uh, you watch this movie and it is a hundred percent. Like you don't even have to know that it's a Nancy Myers. Oh movie. yeah. As soon as you watch it, you're like, this is a fucking Nancy Myers movie. Oh yeah. She, she um, just, she has a way of telling her stories. She loves bougie, uh, really rich white people, and they're yeah. they're wonderful like accoutrements of their lives. And that's that's a holiday. That is a holiday. That's like I am going to go and hang out with these people who have no problems. Yep. Their biggest problems are not problems. Yeah. And that's that's fun. That's one of the reasons why we go to the movies sometimes. So I don't object to that. Sometimes I just feel like they're so divorced from reality I can't get involved. But everyone's really sweet in the holiday. I, I think they she wisely realized what a treasure Jack Black was back when he was still mostly getting comic relief parts, and he's awesome in that movie. I mean, one of the reasons why I wanted to move back to LA was because I wanted to find my miles and I didn't, so Aww. I left. So, oh, <laughs> you, oh, like, seriously, like, he's like that, ca that character is so perfect, and I feel like yeah. that is. I feel like he performs it so well because mm. there's a part of him that, like a very large part of him that is Miles. Yeah. Like it's just, it fits him so beautifully. And actually uh, Video Drew and Eric did a video chronic quiz mm. uh, on this on Tuesday, I think. Oh, I that one, yeah. um, okay. It is, it's, it's a lot of fun. I got to compete against uh, Video Drew and Peggy and uh, Vanessa mm. and Alex um uh, uh McFarland. So uh it's all five girls like competing for this movie that we absolutely love. It was it's a great quiz, it's so much fun. That's but I, I desperately love this movie. It is one of my favorites. I think that there is uh, there are more Christmas action movies than people talk about. Yeah. Um, I think some of them we obviously die hard one and two, lethal weapon one. Uh, but uh, there's a there's a few smaller ones that people don't talk about. You ever see Everly with Salma Hayek? No. Salma Hayek, it's Die Hard in one room. What? Salma nice. Hayek has been kidnapped by a like, long time by a like major mafioso, like Kill Bill type bad guy. And she basically, she, she decides to break out on Christmas Day and she can't break out. They just send wave after wave of assassins in to kill Salma Hayek. And she keeps killing them. And like the room's geography keeps changing as stuff gets blown up and everything. It's Pretty dang cool. I, I think that movie needs to be talked about more. Definitely um, adding that to my list. Yeah, it's pretty neat. It's, it's dark, but it's good. Um, the one that I, I I always feel like is this huge missed opportunity. I, they introduce it as a Christmas movie, and then they forget that it's a Christmas movie. Jurassic World. The kids at the beginning of the movie, yeah. it's Christmas time. They're going to Jurassic World for Christmas break. Yeah. They explicitly say that. And then they go to Jurassic nope. World, a theme park, and nothing is Christmas themed. That's there are no Christmas true. decorations. There aren't any Santas walking around. It's a theme park. And it's a theme park in like the Western world. So like there really should be that's they're gonna make a lot of money off of Christmas stuff. They're gonna be selling ornaments, they're gonna be selling all kinds of stuff. Why is there nothing Christmassy? in Jurassic World when they go they could have been said any time it could have been a summer break movie they said I, it at Christmas why not I just got so angry at the fact that I didn't get to see a Tyrannosaurus Rex with a fucking Santa hat on what right. is going on remember, remember, remember that ad campaign for We Bought a Zoo where it was just posters of various animals with like ribbons on and like it was like for Christmas buy a zoo and it's not even a Christmas movie that should have been the Jurassic World it's just like it's a T Rex, but he's got a big red bow on him. Boom, sold, sold. What's the matter with you? Huge mistake. Like I really want to like stop this interview so I can like so I can tweet to Universal about how angry I am about this right now. <laughs> it's so weird. I just I can never get over it. Um, I'm so angry right now. Know. Well, I was listening to your list though, and I was realizing that you don't seem to have a lot of movies on your list. That are like classic movies, like classic. Oh no, classic, I, was, like I, was, I was getting to those. I oh, definitely have. Okay, great. Oh yeah. Okay. So, what, what's, on, what's on that list? So obvious. So that actually led into uh, the question that I asked you about the movie that. Hmm. 
with watching a Christmas story. It just okay. wasn't something like, and I don't know if it was be, like, my parents raised us very much as little girls in the late eighties, early nineties. So like anything that was like very hardcore, like boy driven because things were very gender appointed back then. Um, we just didn't do or didn't watch for the most part, um, which is weird because my dad was super into wrestling. Mm -hmm. um, so I've got, you know, a Christmas story, but like, I'm really wasn't into it. Um, I, obviously, uh, a Muppet Family Christmas, which I love mm -hmm. to death. Uh, the Muppet Christmas Carol, Charlie Brown Christmas, Home Alone, It's a Wonderful Life. Okay. Uh, love Actually, Miracle on 34th Street, Nightmare Before mm -hmm. Christmas. Okay. All of the Franken Bass. Uh, or the Rankin Bass, uh, uh, the Santa Claus movies, White Christmas. I tried last year. I added the holiday, or was it Holiday into that? And it just, I, Ooh, I no. can't get through it now. No, Holiday Inn is a weirdly toxic movie. Um, it's real bad. It's not. It's not um, good. I there's there's that one. There's a couple of really good dance numbers in it, but and you can like lift that out and just watch those on YouTube. Yeah, those are really great dance numbers. Yeah, but like when when they when they get to February. Oh yeah. Um. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Just, the big blackface number. It's horrifically offensive. I was working at a Hollywood video. That's this is how old I am. I was working at a Hollywood video in the early two thousands, and we had rules about what we could and could not show on the big set of TV screens in the back of the store. Uh, <laughs> it was I think it was before five o'clock. You could put in anything PG or less. Mm hmm. And after five o'clock, you could only put in this like 90 minute long clip show and they'd send us a new video every every month. Just oh. here are the previews of the stuff coming out this month right. at Hollywood Video. Get everyone excited. Like, oh, is that out on DVD now? I'll rent that. Yeah. Uh, but for Christmas, like around like November, December, we got a special list. These are the only Christmas movies you're allowed to show. Okay, I'm like, okay, it's a pretty long list, but Holiday Inn was on it. And I was oh, like, we need to cross that shit off the fucking list because that is a really offensive movie. And on top of it all, on top of it just being horrifically racist, Fred Astaire's a piece of shit in that movie. Yeah, he, he is. is terrible. He's a terrible human being. And then Bob is it no Bob, it's uh, Bing Crosby. And then Bing Crosby isn't a lot better when he starts like trying to ruin the woman he loves career because he's jealous what? of it's not good. Like, why because he wants her to stay good. with him and like yeah. be a housewife and shit. I'm like, this is so 1940s. It's oh so good. It's, it's not good at all. It's not good at all. No, and, and and it's not even if like you shouldn't have to wrap your head around that. There's this weird thing I've noticed when you're watching old movies, and I love old movies, but you have to remember that they're made at a different time, and that's mm -hmm. not. And I, a lot of people would say like, oh, and that's an excuse to like smooth over. Like, no, 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 no. I'm actually gonna yeah. take the excuse away. If you watch an old movie and you none of the characters discuss race at all and they don't interact with any people of color, you realize that the odds are exceptionally good that those characters are racist. Yeah. At least racist for the time. You know, like the there was there was a baseline of racism uh yeah. in, in Western culture. It was the and, acceptable racism. Yeah, like this is like this is as racist as we are right now. And Wait, for, any, for anybody listening, those were air quotes, by the way. Huge air quotes. <laughs> air, Huge air, air quotes. quotes. No, we're not forgiving this at all. But like there was a lot of white people who were willing to really look the other way. And you got to realize that there's a decent chance that it, by the moral standards of today, even the nice characters from old movies are probably really shitty people, unless yeah. they explicitly deal with it in some way, and most movies didn't. Because yeah. if they did, in fact, there were actually movies that were banned from certain southern states if people of color were treated too nicely. Mm hmm which is shocking and gross. Um, there was one version of Brewster's Millions where they had a person of color who was treated pretty well and got a good job at a business and that got that movie banned in several Southern states. It's repulsive. Um, well, there was an episode of the Golden Girls where yeah. um, Blanche is working at a hotel and mm -hmm. like she puts up, you know, the rebel flag and like her assistant is black and he like tells like it's a beautiful episode. Ooh. Like yeah. it is a fantastic episode. She's like, for me, that's heritage. He's like, for me, that's heritage of death. Like yeah. they have a whole massive discussion about it. And it's like well, handled it. really beautifully. But that episode was not aired in the South when it first came out. And oh, that was like that. the early nineties. 
here's here's a weird bit of TV history, and this isn't this isn't Christmassy, uh, but uh, one of the biggest television events in the history of television was the birth of Lucille Ball and Ricky's baby. Oh, watch, I love Lucy. I Love Lucy is an incredibly important television series. Many episodes of I Love Lucy are still some of the funniest things you've ever seen. Oh, my God. The, the eggs episode. Oh, yeah. Oh. The eggs episode's really, really great. Uh, uh, yeah, chocolate. Chocolate conveyor belt's really, really classic. The one that where Lucy hides... Nice. The Lu one where Lucy is, like, caught snooping in someone else's apartment and she has to pretend to be a chair is an incredibly brilliant bit of physical comedy. Uh, but... There's a reason why they don't show every episode in reruns, and I bought uh, 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 the like complete box set of I Love Lucy, like every episode mm -hmm. ever. And yeah, it turns out that the episode in which uh, little Ricky, I think it's Ricky Jr., is born, this was the biggest TV event ever, give or take. Yeah. The reason they never air that is because the reason why the comedy reason why Ricky can't be there in the hospital when his son is born, he keeps trying to get in and he can't do it, is because he was just performing a show and he's trying to get in while wearing blackface. Yeah. It's fucked up. It is not funny. It's really gross. And yeah, yeah. We just we just don't we don't really uh they're not really proud of that one. You know? No, because yeah. I mean it it's it, it by modern by modern definition, it is minorities like raging on like negging on minorities. Like yeah. it is awful yeah, and just really so gross. horrible. Like yeah, ooh. it's really really it's really really terrible. But um, but that but to get back on onto the track of the Christmas movies, though, I do think that there are a lot of really great Christmas movies from the first half of cinema history that. You know, a lot of everyone knows it's a wonderful life. Most people know yeah. Miracle on 34th Street, but there's a lot of really wonderful ones that don't get talked about a lot. And I do like to support them whenever I can. Um, so I thought since we're talking about it, I'd mention a few. I'm curious if you've seen them. Um, have you ever seen The Man Who Came to Dinner? Yes, but I remember watching it when I was like a child. <laughs> okay, so the man who came to dinner uh, uh, is the story of. It's actually based on this one uh, writer, Alexander Wolcott, who was also a radio personality, and uh, he was also a real pill. Uh, but this wonderful actor, Monty Woolley, uh, plays this like celebrity uh, wit who is visiting a small town, slips on the ice, breaks his legs. And like ends up being stuck in this family's house over Christmas, and he's just an asshole. And it's really funny. And Monty Woolley is a really underappreciated actor. I think he's really, really great. So um, that's one I think uh, uh, should get a little bit more, uh, a little bit more credit. I'm trying to think. I already mentioned Christmas in Connecticut. Um, uh, more good old Christmas movies. Uh, it, I think it happened on Fifth Avenue. Is one I'm thinking of. Uh, oh yeah, it's a. Uh, 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 there's a there's a guy he's homeless and he decides to take up residence in a giant mansion where the family just isn't living there right now like for the season. Good for him. And then the family starts coming back and he just sort of ingratiates himself into the family. <laughs> and it's 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 really cute. I like that one it's a perfect. lot. Um, Which one so, is that? It happened on Fifth Avenue. Huh. It's really, really cute. Um, let's see. Um, oh, what's that one with uh, Margaret O'Brien? It's um, uh, I'm just, oh, this is going to drive me out. I have to look up this Margaret O'Brien movie, which is really, really cute. Hang up. Margaret O'Brien Christmas. Where do you stand while I'm doing this? Where do you stand on whether Little Women is a Christmas movie or not? <sighs> I don't count it as like it's it it's not a Christmas movie for me. I can see why other people have it as a Christmas movie, but like okay. that movie wasn't something that I grew up loving. I wasn't I wasn't that kind of little girl when it because mm -hmm. it was it came out like what night ninety four, and I was um, well that that version yeah that yeah. was like ninety three ninety four yeah well like that that like the, that was the that was the first one that came out in my lifetime sure. And so I was 10 years old when that came out and I was very heavily a tomboy. 
So I did not relate with any of these sisters. <laughs> I was like, these girls are all stupid and boring. I wouldn't want to hang out with them. This is bull. Um, oh. Maybe maybe Joe. Um, but like all of the other ones, like I just, I was just like, it, it, I read it and I understood, but it was like, these, these girls aren't for me. Um, now I, I mean, I love the remake or, or the, the newest version. It's a remake. Um, it's good. It's really good. Oh, and no, I no, really no. appreciate it. Um, but like, it's just, it, it, it's not a, a story that hits my heart, mm. you know? Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan, but that's, that's fair. Uh, so the movie I was thinking of, and I, I'm glad I looked it up because I almost forgot an even more famous Margaret O'Brien Christmas movie. But uh, there's a really cute movie that this uh, child actor from the 40s, Margaret O'Brien, starred in with Angela Lansbury called uh, 10th Avenue Angel. And it's about this little poor girl and she's got a pet mouse and someone like tells her that if you make a wish on a mouse, it'll like, it'll like leave you money. And it's just them like trying to like, you know, hey, this magic is good if you're young and you don't know how, how we're all completely screwed and going to die. And she's just like, yeah, but little does she know that like local thieves like hid money near her. So she thinks that like her Christmas wish came true, but in actuality it's, she's like headed towards like this really like dark realization about Christmas fairy tales, but it ends happily. It's really sweet. Um, but there's also Meet Me in St. Louis, which is where yes. uh, Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas comes from. And that is a wonderful film uh, with uh, Judy Garland and Margaret O'Brien and uh, Mary Astor. And it's, God, it's, I love that film. It's really hard for me to watch any uh, Judy Garland movies after you know, Judy came out and doing yeah. the research of what, like, who Judy Garland was uh. and the way that she was treated. Like, it hurts so much to enjoy something when you know that the reason you're enjoying it is because of the actress who was being put through such horrible conditions and being yeah. treated so terribly. It just, it hurts my soul. But Mimi in St. Louis is a hundred percent. Yes. Like Sorry. You, I, Sorry it's I haven't been watching, but yes, it is yeah. uh, on HBO as okay. it is. It happened on Fifth Avenue. Oh, that's great. So that's good. I'm glad they're easily accessible. Uh, someone on here, I think it's also the same person was talking about um, Shop Around the Corner with uh, Jimmy Stewart, which is oh, also... A hundred percent. That that story is always a little dark because there's that period at the end, whether you're watching the original or you've got mail, uh, there's always that bit at the end where one of them knows and the other one doesn't and they're being a little manipulative. And I think it plays better in the Jimmy Stewart version because in the Jimmy Stewart version... He he she she really treats him like shit. So like he's trying to like ingratiate her in real life before she knows it's him, so she won't reject him all the way. It's still not ideal, but I think it plays better than the Meg Ryan one, where he's also like trying to put her out of business and succeeds. Yeah. And it's really gross. And but yeah. at the end when he like, you know, they meet up and she starts crying and he gives her his handkerchief and he goes, don't cry, little shop girl. I'm always like, oh, no. because I'm a softie and I cry. I actually I really, everything. My favorite, uh, I'm, I cry a lot too, but that one doesn't do it for my, my favorite bit. And you've got mail is actually um, the bit where uh, Greg Kinnear admits that he's fallen in love with someone else. And my grand's like, great. You're better to, yes, good like, for you. That whole breakup dinner yeah. that they go through, it's so wonderful. I'm like, what can all breakups be like this? That sounds amazing. Yeah. It's, a, I it's did, a, yeah. I did, I did love Birdie in that, you know, she's like, I bought Apple at six. <laughs> like, <laughs> she's just so cute. And they figure out that she like had an affair with a Spanish warlord or something like that. Like, it's just oh, so gosh. endearing and so sweet. Like, and Steve Zahn is perfect in that he's movie. Good. He's wonderful. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so many, so many brilliant people doing brilliant things in bad movies. <laughs> it really, it really sucks sometimes. I feel bad for them sometimes. They're not bad. Like I sometimes seen, they're bad. I've seen bad movies, and actually, yeah. Boris Leachman is in the worst that I've ever seen in my entire life, and it is terrible. Also has a really good cast, and that Wait, is uh, my uh, boyfriend's back. I'm oh, sorry. Shit. Are you saying my boyfriend's back? Can you hear bad? me? I can now. My boyfriend's back is a now terrible movie. It has a great no, no, no. cast. It's a great movie. No, no, no. It's a great movie. That's where you're wrong. You're, you're completely. You got this all backwards. My boyfriend's back is the best movie ever. I don't understand how we how we how we completely cross paths like this. I feel like I entered into a Twilight Zone. Like this movie. You really don't, I, oh my god. 
I went, I literally, I remember I was getting my hair cut at my local, uh, at the place that we always got my hair cut. I was like eight, I think. And this person walked in from the radio station and handed out screener passes. So my mom grabs a few and my older sister, she takes me, my Were older you sister. in Pasadena? No, I grew up in San Jose. Okay. okay, that's weird because I actually was offered a screening pass to this one too. But it was, I was like in Pasadena. That's hilarious. Yeah, it was like the radio screeners. Um, okay. uh, and so we got these tickets and I took a friend and my older sister took a friend. Um, my little sister was like four, so she didn't go, obviously. So we're sitting there and watching this movie. And I just remember being so horrified by how this girl was getting turned on that her, that this guy was a zombie. And I was just like, I can't deal with this. This is so terrible. And so many bad messages for females right now. Like I can't stomach well, this. Okay. I, I can appreciate that. I, I, here's my thing though. For me, I look at it as a dark comedy in the vein of John Waters. Oh, it's funny as fuck. That's my point. That's, that's why I that's why I kind of dig it is because I feel like there's nothing sincere about the romance to it. I feel like it's all very very arch. Um, it's directed by Bob Balaban, uh, of course, is a beloved character actor. He did a movie called Parents. Did you ever see Parents? No. Amazing movie. It's about this little boy in the 1950s and his seemingly idyllic suburban household. His dad is played by Randy Quaid before he. Yeah. Um. And uh, but the thing is, is that the little kid is increasingly convinced that his parents are serving him human meat for dinner. Huh. And it very much plays in that sort of Halcyon, Capra esque kind of uh, uh, you know mold. But then it adds this incredibly horrifying element to it, and it's really really good. I, I interviewed Bob Balaban once and I got to tell him I wanted, I just told him I was like, "Hey, listen, this one should I know before this interview. I I love parents." And without missing a beat, Bob Balaban says, "Oh, you must be a very strange person." And I was like, <laughs> "Yeah. That's, that's fair, Bob. That's fair. I think you you made parents. You get you, you would know. Um, but uh, yeah, Parents is a really really great creepy movie. I, I hope more people get to see it. Oh, PC, we were talking about my boyfriend's back and how horrifying it is. Like, I just, I can't. <sighs> I mean, I know, like, what is it? Philip Seymour Hoffman's in that and Matthew like, Fox. Matthew McConaughey. Matthew McConaughey. Uh, Cloris Leachman. Um, honestly, look it up. It is, it, it's a really great cast. But yeah. the movie, I just remember watching it as a young, well, as a very young girl and just being like, this is terrifying. It's like, <laughs> Like, this is not something that I should be watching. Like, I remember sitting in the movie theater being like, Mom, I want to get out of here. This is not something that I should be watching. And just being like, peace out, Cub Scout. Um, <laughs> good Lord, that movie was awful. Um, I have gone back and watched it, and it did make me laugh a little bit more. But it's still, like, very sickening, just the way that they treat the whole girlfriend. I'm like, wow, she really doesn't have a mind of her own. And this is really, uh -huh. really disturbing that she's moving on his ear and then pulls it off his head because he's decaying. And yeah. she gets even more turned on. And I'm like, yeah. girl. Hey, there's get... someone there's I'm someone like, out there for everybody. That's all I think that's the point. Yeah, but literally it would have she would have just whittled him down to exactly what she needed. And you can order that from Day Plan. <laughs> they have a sale going on right now. It's battery powered. It's, it's about it's about the journey, not the destination. It can come in black if that's what you want. Like yeah. decaying yeah. flesh, you could probably dye it. It's fine. Like just woof. It was just so <laughs> no. Well, that's that's a hundred percent fair. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> we do have a stream lab that came oh. in. Um, oh, hi. Michael K says, Hi Bibbs. I know hi. you and I were gushing about Wolf Walkers, but what are your thoughts on the rest of Cartoon Saloons? Filmography, The Secret oh. of the Hills, Song of the Seas, The Breadwinner. Guys, and actually, before we answer this, uh, if you have any questions for Bibbs, we're going to close out in about 15 minutes. So throw those questions into Streamlabs. We'll answer those before we're done, and then we'll close out sure. with our favorite question because uh, we haven't talked about okay. one of my favorite uh, topics yet, but uh, the question. Okay. Okay. Uh, for uh, the, uh, the Cartoon Saloon, uh, that, that is a brilliant production company, and they so far, they are, they're batting a 1,000. Uh, Secret of Kells is absolutely incredible. Song of the Sea is an absolutely incredible uh, parable about uh, Selkies and Wolfwalkers. Have you seen Wolfwalkers yet, Rachel? 
No, I've seen Song of the the Song of Cal's and like mm. destroyed my just just destroyed me emotionally. <laughs> yeah, Wolf Walkers is really incredible. I think it's already it's right near the top of my list. It's probably my pick for the best film of the year if I were to make my list right now, but it was my catching up to do. Uh, it's one of the best werewolf movies I've ever seen. It's an incredible, incredibly good movie. Uh, so I love that. Breadwinner uh, made my list of the best animated films of the last decade. Uh, they're incredible. They also did a short film I want to make sure people know about. Uh, let me find it because it was nominated for an Academy Award for Best uh, Animated Short. Uh, let me see here. Late Afternoon is an incredibly heart-wrenching animated short uh, that uh, that they did uh, that is about a woman who uh, uh, I believe she has Alzheimer's. Oh. Uh, and it's all about how her memories are sort of flooding together. It is absolutely beautiful and heartbreaking. Um, and it's very, very short, but it's absolutely incredible. Um, they're amazing. They're, they do amazing work. And if you're not familiar with uh, their stuff, please see all their stuff because so far it's all brilliant. Apparently, they're also producing a TV series for Disney Plus called Viking School, and it looks That's exciting. Like, I mean, I'm I'm down for anything Viking. My mom's side is Norwegian, mm -hmm. so you know. Yeah, I grew up watching Eric the Vikings, so you know that was a big formative experience for me. That's just basically my literally every Thanksgiving when I get together with my mom's side of the family. <laughs> nice. They're they're all over six feet, blonde and like blue eyed. Like they're just stunning creatures, and like I'm like, oh, my mom had sex with an Italian. Uh, Oh, so well, hey, whoa, uh, baby Ani, hello. You're, oh, yeah. You're, you're, yeah, oh, no, that's no, not so no. bad. That's not are so you, bad. Are you kidding? I'm <laughs> like, okay, fuck with me, try it. Like, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> but like being around just like just that side of my family, like it's mm. it's very apparent. Like, wow, mm. you guys are all related. A hundred percent. So, what are your so? We did movies. We've talked a lot about movies because I feel like Christmas movies are so, so powerful. And it's it, it literally like I have so many of my like non-Christian friends that's or mm. so many of my friends that don't celebrate Christmas that love Christmas movies like more than most people I know that celebrate Christmas. Mm -hmm. um, but Christmas music has a very dear uh, and specific place in my heart. Um I know everybody does the Wham Christmas challenge. Um, I am still competing for it. Where the longer it's 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 basically a game of once you hear it, you're out. Oh, and it's uh uh, uh the, 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 um la is it last Christmas? Yeah. Last you know, if you heard Christmas, I gave you my heart, but the does it have to be the original version or can it be any version? No, it's just wham. Just wham. So if you hear that that awful glee version. It doesn't count. Right. Okay, just check it. Mean, they started, I mean, they started speaking that one what? onto the radio a couple of years ago. And I was like, the fuck is this? This isn't wham. What have you done to I feel like you know, like we've secretly replaced your coffee with Folgers Crystals, but like yeah. Folgers Crystals sucked. Like, like that's wait a minute. What the fuck what is, is that? this shit? Like it's uh, uh like I don't know if like if like my high school aged kids were singing it, I'd be kind of impressed, but come on. Um yeah. I, I definitely failed that that uh, that that test already. That that's already gone. I live for. Uh, I don't know if everyone has this, but uh, in LA, and the radio station has changed. But there's always been like one radio station that, like after Thanksgiving, plays nothing but Christmas music. Oh my uh, god! Uh, Earth one hundred and one. It used to be Kareth 101. They stopped doing it. They're still playing regular old mu music. Uh, mm -hmm. It's actually Coast 103.5 right now. Oh. That has been doing nothing but Christmas music. And they've been pretty good, actually. It's pretty good assortment. I don't... There's a few songs that are, like, eking their way into the regular Christmas rotation that I don't think belong there. Like, um... Where are you, Christmas? I... Don't know where Christmas is. I'm trying it's to me. find you. Well, it's I mean, behind the couch, maybe. Well, also, you just don't like that movie, so I. I don't understand. like that movie. I also just don't think it's a good Christmas song in, in and of itself. There's a lot of like great Christmas songs that come from not very good movies. White Christmas well, is a good example of that. 
Ta Taylor Momsen, uh, the girl who played Cindy Lou Who in that mm -hmm. version, um, went on to, uh, she was in, um, what was Charlie it? Beth I, I, she was in, Gar she was in Gossip Girl. Mm -hmm. uh, wow and had this like pristine little like schoolgirl image and then i remember seeing her on warp tour with a punk band yeah with, like black like like panda bear like makeup and black lipstick and i was like aren't you and she goes don't say it and i'm like you're cindy lou who and she goes Fuck. and i'm like what are you gonna do you're the size of my calf like <laughs> you're not gonna hurt me i mean she could probably stab me with her elbow but like yeah. it was really funny um I don't, oh i don't know is paypal down it shouldn't oh, be no, that would be bad timing hold on let me let me refresh Streamlabs, guys if you're sending if you send something in uh let me know in the chat yeah um sorry about that because sometimes it doesn't really notify me and i like have to go back and double check uh -huh. um paypal should not be down um okay. um no i i mean i i'm i'm a sucker for christmas albums huh. like the insane christmas album I mean, anything Kelly Clarkson sings, I just love her to death. Rob, because Robbie Williams has a new Christmas album out this year that's actually really good. Robbie Williams is amazing. Yes, he um, is. I, I love agree. his music. Uh, he's so good. Yeah, he has a double album that came out like last month, and it's really good. He has, he has a Christmas song about COVID, and I actually have had a cut stuck in my head. Uh, like, <laughs> Santa's on his sleigh, but now he's two meters away. It's really cute. <laughs> I just I love I love that people write new Christmas songs. Like I yeah. understand that, like you know, I, I I and I have no problem rebuying the same song sung by like twenty five different people from different right. albums. Like that, totally fine. Yes, yeah. it was pretty reckless. That was the band. Thank you. Uh, you that was that was Taylor Momsen's band. Uh, but yeah. like, like, I remember. My dad used to work a lot, and so I never really saw him too much growing up until I was about 10, but he would always take Christmas off. Mm. Um, he would Every year, he would have Christmas off, and we had a record player, and he would always put on Mario Lanza's Christmas album, like the, the record. Mm -hmm. And so that, to me, mm. is Christmas. That and John Denver and the Muppets. Also good. For me, it's not Christmas until I hear Feliz Navidad on the radio. <laughs> that is the most joyous song. I don't know why. It's my, it was my dad's favorite. And I think he just it made him smile from ear to ear. I, he just loved how happy it was. Um, so for me, that's probably my favorite Christmas song. Um, uh, I'll Be Home for Christmas is, is right up there. Uh, Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas is a heartbreaker all the time. Those two were really hard for me to listen to while I was on yeah. tour because I was never home for Christmas. Yeah. Oh, so it was just they really connect. A really hard time for me uh, for the seven years that I was out on tour, especially the first few because those were right after my dad passed away and I was out on tour and I couldn't get to see my family. Um, yeah. But thankfully, my my old boss was very attuned and very comforting and accommodating towards it, and he understood and would snap me out of it when I needed to. He's like, okay, I'll let you wallow, but there's a time limit. <laughs> I'm like, okay, that's fine. I'm, I'm that's sweet. I, I, uh, I'm constantly fascinated by the Christmas carols whose lyrics don't make sense. <laughs> there's a few that didn't make sense to me. And now I realize that they did like, um, from for a long time when I was growing up, it's the most wonderful time of the year. Cute song, but there's a line in it. Like, uh, There'll be no names and scary ghost stories. And I'm like, scary ghost stories? What the hell are you talking about? And it turns out, it, well, Christmas Carol was actually one of, in a long tradition of Christmas themed ghost stories. Like oh. there was a ton. In fact, a lot of them have been like, uh, uh, my wife and partner, Michelle, a couple of years ago, got like a book that collected a lot of like the Victorian era Christmas ghost stories that would be like printed in like newspapers. That was not uncommon. That was just a thing. So that's something that we've kind of lost, but it was part of the tradition for a long time. So that was kind of cool. For me, the one that really always ticks me off is um, Frosty the Snowman. <laughs> because okay. there's the there's the I'm, I'm with you so far okay there's a magic hat frosty's dancing around being cool sounds great uh and, uh, and then, uh 
there's something, something, something right to the traffic cop. And he only paused a moment when he heard him holler stop. And we will never get back to that plot point. No. They okay. never get back to that. They, they walk <laughs> this magical creature past the traffic cop. And the traffic cop hollers, stop! And I'm thinking, when in fiction do we see scenes like that where, like, all of a sudden you're confronted by the police, there's a freeze frame, and then the story doesn't continue? It's like the end of The Sopranos or the end of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. They shot Frosty. That's what that means. Frosty died really bad. Well, I mean, if you watch the cartoon, the magician whose hat got lost, the magician who could never do magic, whose yeah. hat was magic, that brought Frosty to life, tries to kill Frosty by putting him in a heater yeah. like, in, 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 like, and trying to melt him. Like, that is some dark shit. It's pretty fucking dark. I would, I would, you know what I want? I yeah. want almost like an American horror story anthology for Christmas stories. Actually, weird that they haven't done that one yet. Like, I want it so yeah. bad. Uh, Ryan Murphy is nothing if not an exploitative shill, so I'm sure he'll he'd work on it if he can. He's running out of he's running out of stuff to do. Guys, let's all tweet him and be like, "Hey, you know, it would be really great." Yeah, and um, and while and while you're at it, Ryan, apologize for the prom. Come on, that was, <laughs> oh, that was that not good. What you did that remake was so. That was a bad movie. You made a bad to, movie, Petey. I I rewatched that for uh for the horror free in preparation for the horror free for all, oh. and I just got there like, huh. No, no, I don't mean I don't mean the slasher remake, the prom, although that movie is terrible too. And you realize how much of that movie is just Idris Elba not wanting to stop a prom. Like yeah. everyone dies in that movie because Idris Elba's like, oh, who am I to ruin prom? Fuck you, Idris. Stop the prom. No, I'm I talking just, about the new Netflix movie that Ryan Murphy directed, which is really bad. No, I, I love Idris Elba. He makes me He's happy. Um, we do have a few stream lives before we hey. head out. Let's um, go. PC says, hello, Beast. Always rooting for you. I have a Mankind mankind pin last spectacular. Mm. I have you a Mankind. Oh, she gave you? Gave I you. still have that. I still mankind have that. Mankind pin last spectacular. Wait, Mankind is in like. The wrestler. As in like McFoley? Yeah. Um, so funny story. Um, I've met Mick and we've been in talks uh, since we met in like February and I was trying to get him on for the holiday episode because he's such a holiday fan. Like he has that's a awesome. really big that. house that's constantly decorated for Christmas. And like, I got to ask him a Christmas question oh at his special. It was amazing. And uh, I'm a lifetime fan. So I'm very jealous that you have this pin. Sorry. I'll uh, keep, asking, I'll keep asking yeah. your question. PC um, favorite Lucy episode. I grew up watching. I love Lucy as a kid in LA love Madam X, but almost any, but almost all episodes. Uh, okay, first off, thank you again for that pin. That meant a lot to me, and I still treasure it, and I keep it. It's not nearby, or I'd grab it right now. But um, hold on. I want to look up. There's. I'm trying to remember the exact name of the Lucy episode. Uh, there's two I really, really love more than any others. Uh, I love Lucy. Okay, there's one with a bit called Slowly I Turn. Um, and uh, I think it's called The Ballet is the episode okay. but uh, it's basically lucy like trying to like learn a comedy bit and, like an old vaudevillian comes in and he like has this oh my god has this bit where there's like this trigger word where if you say his ex-wife's name he goes slowly i turn and he like <laughs> tries to kill you but you have to like it it's a simple gag i can't i'm, I'm gonna ruin it um and then hold on there's another one um are you unpopular? Um, <laughs> it's uh, oh, it's when Lucy uh, gets uh, uh, an advertising gig for Vitamita Vegemin. Vitamita Vegemite, yeah, yeah, yeah. For Lucy does a TV commercial uh, where it turns out that she has to like take a sip of it every single time she does a take. It's but what she doesn't know is that it's alcoholic. So she gets drunker and drunker until finally, when they're going to do it on live on, on live TV, she is completely fall down drunk. And every single line in the commercial that we've heard like eight times already is hilarious. If you transpose words, it's a brilliant setup. It's great. It works yeah. so beautifully. That one is one of my favorites. Uh, the chocolate uh, factory is one of my favorites. The eggs was one of the long, I think it's still the longest recorded live studio laugh oh. in 
all of television history. I didn't know that one. That's cool. Um, I mean, it was at the time. I'm pretty sure it's still the it, like I I'm pretty sure that's still the record. Um, uh, what was it? Oh, the episode where they had this whole series of episodes where they went to L.A. And Lucy and Ethel steal John Wayne's footprints. I, that's a great one. From in front of uh, Grauman's theater. It is, and a, then break it. It is so, like, it's just so perfect. That's it's, a great, that whole season is great because that's the season where Ricky goes to Hollywood yeah. to star in like a Don Juan movie. It's actually like a seasonal arc, which nobody yeah. did at the time. And they have, it's an excuse for like a million amazing cameos. And they're um, all hilarious. The bread episode where she adds too much yeast. Yes. Um, it's yeah. it's so Classic. like she was just so brilliant and so ahead of her time. She's also like the reason for any fans who for any for any uh, Star Trek fans who don't know, she's mm -hmm. the reason that Star Trek got made. So she's, she's the reason why reruns yeah. exist. Yeah, you know, TV used to just be live and they were recorded on video and then they just erase over it. Uh, I Love Lucy was the show that insisted we're going to shoot this thing on film and we're going to protect it. And when we're done with it, we can re-air it later. Yeah, And sure. that's why they made a ton of money on that. And that changed television forever. Yeah, she's she's she was so ahead of her time and yeah. she doesn't get the recognition that she deserves. Um yeah, amazing. Uh, Devlin says favorite asks favorite foreign Christmas song or version of one. Also, Bibbs, lovely to see you. Holiday soaps you're making this year. Um, oh. Take care of yourselves. Be safe. Be well. And be kind. Enjoy the holidays. So yeah, uh, I, I, hold on a second. Yeah. Let me uh, let me uh, let me show you. I, they're in the other side of the room, and I gotta pick up. I, they're not sealed yet, so I want to make sure I don't contaminate them. One sec. All right. So in that time that he's gone, uh, guys. Throw in your uh, throw in your favorite uh, Christmas episodes of TV of all time. We can talk about those. Uh, we'll be talking about those in depth uh, the next episode during the uh, the watch along or after the watch along, I should say. Um, I do have a very special guest for next week, which I'm I think you guys might really like. Um, but I'll tell you guys at the end because I'm actually really excited to hear. <laughs> so okay, I only have we, we these are all Michelle's designs. Uh, these are not mine. Uh, she's the soap genius in the family. I get to like play around. It's like a hobby for me, but for her, it's work. And we're actually going to start a store uh, next year, and it's going to be real exciting. But uh, right now, I've got two on hand. Uh, this right here is uh, a gingerbread house. Oh uh, it, smells, it smells very, very strongly of gingerbread. It's absolutely incredible. Uh, it's this so one, I, yeah, and this one, this one, I'm not sure how well it's going to show up on camera, but it's really cool in person. Uh, this is a snow globe, uh, and you can see there's a there's a tree in there and some Christmas presents. Oh. And uh, if, if you actually like are washing with this, like if you put water on it, uh, this translucent becomes very clear. And what's cool is like, as you wash it down, uh, you know, you scrub it and the uh, Christmas tree and the presents start to like sort of thaw out of the ice. It's really cool. That's all Michelle, that's her design. That's her idea. We didn't get that from like a book or anything like that. She is a genius at this. So magical. <laughs> I cannot wait. I cannot wait uh, for people to be able to start like getting these. Uh, so uh, by all means, please just follow us on Twitter. Um, well, and, actually, uh, we'll, actually we'll, we'll be able to do all that. PC wants to know if you guys have an Etsy shop for the summer. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. We're 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 done a few local like orders for like friends and family this Christmas. Uh, but we're the plan is to open a proper store online in January, uh, which will probably feature a few designs right up front. We might like reveal new designs every single month. Uh, the Schmodown designs those probably won't go on the market. I might make them just for friends and family and such, but no, this is, um, I got those. So, um, I, mean, I have no problem losing to you if I get a bar of soap. That's all. Like soap. That's, my, my goal, seriously, is from here on out, anyone I play, win or lose, I'm going to make a specialized soap just for them uh, in the Shmodan. Yeah, uh, dude. Yeah. There, there are so many people. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God. Yes. You should absolutely have Ooh, a table. At that's, a, event. that's a really good idea. And I'm going to totally run that by Michelle when I wrap this up, because that's a brilliant idea. And we're totally going to do that. That's a great idea. And thank you everyone for, for your support in advance. Uh, we're really excited about it. We just need to make sure we do it the right way. We don't want to just like throw some, some, you know, pictures we take off of our phone. We want to make sure it looks nice and everything professional. So, um, yes. 
Yeah. Um, make a scene. Now I know you gotta go. I'm just checking stream okay. one last time. Okay, we're clear. Yeah, I don't want anyone out. Um, okay, so uh, I'm gonna close this off because we've had so much fun and we could literally keep talking for hours, but I know you gotta go. Um, so I'm gonna end this with the question that I ask everybody, and it is my favorite question from one of my favorite movies, Almost Famous. Do you have to be happy to write a love song? Do you have to be sad to write a sad song? What is it that you love about music? Everything. Um, I actually auditioned for the lead role in that. Shut up. I got, call, I got a call back too. And then I blew it because I got too excited. That's true. That's 100% true. Um, so you auditioned for William? Yeah. And actually at the time it was, uh, they were keeping it a secret because Cameron Crowe was like a really big filmmaker, like especially at the time. And uh, so the script that I had, the, the audition piece I had, was the scene where he has to tell Penny that like the band betrayed her, uh, but it for, it was they oh. they switched it out as though I was on it as though William was on not a concert tour but a campaign trail, and she was like an intern working for like a politician. Interesting. It was really cool. Um, you had a for fifty dollars and a case of beer. Yeah. What kind of what beer? Kind oh, of beer. Exactly. Literally, yeah. like that that exact scene yeah. for her is like. Yeah. That is my most, in my opinion, the most well acted scene with mm. no words in the f history of film. Wow. Like that scene speaks to me on so many fucking levels. I That's love great. that. Well, it's great. And I, and uh, uh, it's a great movie. Uh, so I, I totally get it. But yeah, I do, I, I, I do love music very much. It's great. <laughs> um, thank you so much for having me on the show. I really appreciate oh it. Oh my God, you're the best. Uh, if you can hang out, uh, I'd love to talk to you for a few minutes afterwards. I just got to close up yeah. and do a few. Thanks. So everybody say bye-bye, William. Love you so much. Okay. Uh, real quick before uh, I got to go. Um, tomorrow night uh, is the Mandalorian season two finale after show uh, over at the Gucci verse at 6 PM. It's going to be me, Sully, Saul, and Chris. It's going to be so much fun next week. I'm doing a very special holiday watch along on Wednesday, not Thursday. Cause Thursday is Christmas Eve Wednesday at 7 PM. Uh, Pacific Standard Time or Pacific Daylight Time. It's going to be me and Mama Silvestrini watching a Chris a Muppet Christmas or I'm sorry, a Muppet Family Christmas. I'm so excited about it. I'm stumbling over my words. Uh, and then we'll have a huge discussion afterwards. Everyone will hang out. I'm so excited to see you guys all. Uh, and then the rest of the month, uh, I got the watch along next Wednesday. The following Sunday after uh, after Christmas is going to be my Patreon golden day. So if you are not a Patreon, please join. Uh, we have so much fun on those golden days and we just hang out and talk and figure out what's going on with everybody. I want to hear about all about your Christmases. And then we're doing a new year's Eve special. Um, the time is going to be adjusted because, uh, Mark Ellis is doing a comedy special. We really want to support him. So we'll probably go live after that. Um, again, Patreon, we've got a lot of things coming in 2021 because Fuck 2020. Um, <laughs> I'm so excited. Thank you guys so much. You guys are the best. And now time for my favorite thing, the 